call this meeting to order. Um, this is the Tuesday, January 30th, 2018 City of Andover Council meeting. Start off with a roll call to my left. Brian Schwann, Council Member. Troy Tabor, Council Member. Ben Lawrence Mayor. Clark <coughs> C.R. Nelson, Council Member. Greg Schneider, Council Member. Mike Warrington, Council Member. Mike Keller, Police Chief. Donna Davis, Chief Financial Officer. <coughs> Chad Russell, Fire Chief. Jennifer McCausland, Assistant City Administrator. J.T. Klaus, City Attorney. Rick Lancer, Assistant Director of Public Works. Susan Renner, City Clerk. Mark Detter, City Administrator. Item number three is the invocation. I don't believe I see any chaplains here this evening. Um, Troy, would you be so gracious as to lead us in prayer? I'd be honored. <clears throat> God, thank you for uh, bringing us together tonight as a, as a council, as a community, um, to talk about uh, different things in our community that need to be worked on and addressed. And pray that you'll be in our hearts and our minds tonight as we, uh, as we talk um, and uh, come to an understanding of, of what needs to happen in your grace. Amen. Amen. Item number four is the Pledge of Allegiance. Would you please stand with us? Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Item number six is the acceptance of the agenda. Uh, I know we had some late modifications of additional material this afternoon. Is everybody in receipt of that? Is there anything additional? No, sir. We might have a few overhead things if there's some questions, but nothing that goes into the packet or needs to be given to you at the bench. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, I would move to accept the agenda as presented. Second. Moved by CR, second by Troy to accept the agenda as presented. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Item number seven. We have a series of presentations this evening. Uh, looking for the caring and sharing report. Good evening. Hi, my name is Michelle Carlini, and I'm here tonight on behalf of Andover Caring and Sharing. Um, thanks to our police and fire department, the city, schools, churches, families, and businesses, we were able to provide gifts to over 300 children and food for 96 families this year. Four of those families were seniors that are helping to raise their grandchildren. To give you a little history, in 2015, we helped 176 children and 60 families. So in just a few years, we have experienced over a 50% increase in families that are, we are serving through this program. And I don't know the history before that. So, <clears throat> Names of the families were submitted by the school counselors, excuse me, um, our police and fire departments, the Community Food Bank, St. Vincent de Paul Society, and the Senior Center. And each family is contacted to determine the need. About 15% of the families we contact told us they did not need assistance. Our Rotary volunteers distributed boxes to over 15 businesses. Um, the manager at Menards actually called us and wanted to have a box placed there. They chose, excuse me, chose us over Toys for Tots. Um, we received $4,200 in donations and we spent 5,300 on food and gifts. About 50% of what we receive, of the gifts we need, we receive in the boxes as donations. The rest is purchased. Um, fortunately, we still have a surplus of money from past years. Average cost purchased uh, gifts was $12, and each child gets at least three gifts. So we do a great job, our volunteers. Um, majority of our donations come from fundraising efforts through the schools. The Sammy Halisay Salon 
donated certificates for services, and the YMCA gave us certificates this year for uh, memberships. The Friends of the Library gave over 300 books. Next year, we're actually considering financial giving opportunities where people can sponsor a family. Um, so that's some of the things we're looking at. This year, members of the fire department were present at the uh, hometown Christmas with the fire tricks. The kids loved it, and they got a tour of the truck. Thank you so much, Chief. It was great. Um, changing the dates to be at the lodge on Friday and Saturday worked out better, and about 90% of the family served came there and started picked out gifts for their children, and a lot of the little kids came and made ornaments. Um, Unfortunately, we've outgrown the lodge. It was so crowded that we couldn't really be hospitable to the family. So the committee has actually decided to move everything next year to St. Vincent Paul Catholic Church. Our caring and sharing program is about more than providing gifts and food to the children and families in need in our community. Many of the parents that we contacted this year requested the most basic needs, such as socks and pajamas and not toys. We were able to get a bicycle donated for a father who, has, who was walking to work, a dryer for a family of five that was in desperate need, and a computer for two high school girls that were going to the library each day to do their homework. Through caring and sharing, we are building relationships and trust with these families, letting them know that we are a community that cares about them. Over 100 volunteers from all ages helped to make this event a success, and we thank you for your continued support. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you. Joe, thank you for that presentation. That's, uh, that's good stuff in our community right there. I'll say this again. I say it every year. A lot of people think that Andover is um, pretty fluent, and, and we are to a larger extent. But we have pockets of uh, we have pockets and 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 neighborhoods within our boundaries that uh, are not so fortunate. And uh, we appreciate the work that you do. We appreciate all the donations that uh, everybody gets you to uh, to make that happen. So thank you again. Um, we have a presentation here from, uh, I guess we have an Eagle Scout project. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Josh Montgomery, I am, and I am currently a senior at Andover High School. Uh, I'm working towards my Eagle Scout rank, and part of that rank for Boy Scouts is I have to commit, or I do a service project for the community. And I contacted Mr. Shawpaw, the superintendent here in Andover of Parks, and he and I were going back and forth with ideas, and he, and he suggested that I create birdhouses. So my plan as for my project is to create and then install birdhouses here in Ando Andover Central Park, around the uh, park. And some of them especially would be going around the new running trail on the south end of the park. Do you guys have any questions? So far, so good. <laughs> All right. Um, so like on the day of installation, we would be painting and staining them as I, once my crew and I have created them, is my crew would be my troop. And then it would be replacing the damaged and weathered birdhouses that are already, that had been in the park recently. And it'd be adding additional ones. So. That's my project. What's your budget? Um, well, Mr. Shawpaw has actually donated the uh, materials, and or he will donate them at least. So the Parks Department has the materials for the project already. They just need uh, someone like me or a scout to create them and then install them. You can install any Purple Martin houses? Any what? Purple Martin. Well, I don't know what that Think is. about it. <laughs> it's really good for a park. They eat okay. a lot of mosquitoes. Okay. Think about it. Well, it sounds like a great project. Um, 
I don't have any questions or problems or issues with it. Council, what's your pleasure? Do we need a motion? I think so. To approve. And Mr. President, or Mr. Mayor. <laughs> yeah, Mr. President. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, I make a motion that we, uh, that we approve the project as presented. I'll second. second. Uh, motion by Troy, second by CR to approve the Eagle Scout project as presented. Further discussion? Thank you. All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, item 7.3. We have a report on our golf course this evening. Don't see them present. I thought uh, we were going to have a representative, but it appears we don't. We will try we to. We have get the report, right? Right. We will try to get them on the agenda, though. Part of the agreement we had was they would give a personal report to the council. So if we don't see them tonight. I, I we'll read that report. It actually shows. They were in the black by about a thousand dollars or something. Yeah, I think things are going okay. Yeah, I'm just for pleasant, change. pleasantly surprised. For change, yeah. Okay, we'll move on to item number eight, which is the consent agenda. Uh, a lot of items on that this evening. But there are a lot of little stuff. Um, why don't I read those out so people here uh, know what we're talking about. Um, 8.1 is the City Council meeting minutes of January 9th. Uh, 8.2 is an appropriation ordinance of 88,000. 8.3 is another appropriation ordinance of 837,000. 8.4 is a CVB check request for days in. It's part of the uh, CVB voucher program and drives stays at our local, local motels. Um, 8.5 is the 2017 annual complaint summary and citizen satisfaction survey report, uh, which will be going out when? It's already posted. That's it's from posted. the police department okay. and it's posted online All right. on Eight, our website. 8.6 is the 2017 special law enforcement drug fund report. 8.7 uh, is concerning non-elected personnel for the fire department. 8.8 .8 is non-elected personnel for the park department, and 8.9 is non-elected personnel stuff for the police department. 8.10 is the building safety and security plan update. 8.11 is the entertainment agreements. Uh, these are going to be for artists that are going to be performing at the new amphitheater. And no, we cannot tell you their names. 8.12, uh, park department request uh, to submit grant application for picnic table replacements. 8.13 is the Andover Mini Parks uh, CIP Playground Equipment Purchase. Um, we have some funds in there that were planned in the Capital Improvement uh, Projects uh, Fund. Uh, 8.14 is a Memorandum of Understanding with Butler Community College. 8.15 is the Live Scan Fingerprint System Purchase. 8.16 is the Sewer Plant uh, Sludge Disposal Engineering Services Agreement. 8.17, uh, 818, 819, and 820, all are wastewater purchases for uh, 2018 manhole rehabilitation, automatic gate, automatic samplers, and a new aeration blower. Mr. Mayor, I just want to point out that a lot of those expenditures were gone over in the development of the 2018 budget. Absolutely. And what we've done by policy is if those things were approved in the budget, uh, we put them on the consent agenda because, of course, they're over our spending authority, but we don't feel like they need to be a regular agenda item because they've been discussed in the budget. It's worked out pretty well. I will say I've probably given some speeches about getting on your items and getting them done, and it appears that we have a lot of stuff early they're getting on to uh, get Not complaining. So, no, I'm just, I'm just making sure everybody understands. So we do typically than, don't have that do many More than usual. So. Council, what's your pleasure? Mr. Mayor, I move to approve the consent agenda items 8.1 through 8.20. I'll second it. All right, motion by Greg, second by Mike to approve the consent agenda as presented. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Item number nine. What you have before you here this evening is a list of my annual appointments. Um, also includes council liaison positions to uh, specific departments and other agencies in the community that we like to uh, stay in constant contact with. Does anybody have any issues? Mr. Mayor, I just have 
one I mentioned the other night about I didn't see anything on planning commission on this list. I don't know whether that's intentional or not. That is intentional. Um, I will tell you what, we've always had a council member as a liaison to the planning commission. And um, it becomes tough to, as a council member, to, to be in that meeting and not express opinions or um, say things or even body language sometimes uh, can lend itself to presenting um, an issue, um, especially since that council member is going to be voting on um, that item once it passes through the Planning Commission up to here. I will also say that um, we have a very experienced council. Everybody is uh, well aware of what's going on. You get the Planning Commission meeting minutes. And uh, I didn't think it was necessary um, to have a liaison to the Planning Commission. And frankly, I think it could create a little bit of a conflict if, um, if it was misconstrued the way I think it can be. So therefore, I didn't put a Planning Commission liaison from the council. Do you have anything to add? Mark, do you have anything to add? I guess I would agree with the sentiment. The two bodies are supposed to be separate and independent. And my view is when a council member is there, and I know you've done it this way for years, I don't know if any other city or city attorney could comment that operates with a council member sitting in on the planning commission meeting. Um, I just think it's better for all parties involved if those two things are kept separate and the council member were to hear all the facts at the time of the council meeting in the zoning case put in front of them instead of hearing them twice. I, I don't have any problem with that. In fact, I, I don't know of any questions or opinions that we have had as a council to a liaison who attended a particular meeting. No. It's all... Uh, it's all based you, on you the do minutes. it on your own and so forth. So, although I'd I'd like to see Troy get back on there. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen my list? I'm just asking. <laughs> I'm just teasing. I, I can certainly understand, concur with that. Troy, you do have a um, a large list of liaison positions, and um, I will tell you, I I know you spend a lot of time doing those, and and the city of Andover appreciates your efforts. So. But you're good at them, and Thank so you. I figure I'd keep you there. Thank you very much. But I would need a motion to approve these, especially since uh, some of these appointments include the people sitting in front of you. The city clerk, the city attorney, chief of police. Mr. Mayor, I would move to approve the city appointments as presented uh, by the mayor, effective January 30, 2018. Second. Second now. Okay. Motion by CR, second by Caroline to approve the annual appointments as presented. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Congratulations, Chief. You get to keep your job another year. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, we'll move on to item number 10. Uh, this is a resolution uh, for the hospital. JT, would you like to start us off here? <clears throat> so I want to take a minute, uh, J.T. Klaus, your city attorney and bond counsel. Since we have new council members, I always think it's instructive and helpful to talk about what it is that's being considered and, and where we are in the, in the process. Uh, at, a, at a previous meeting, uh, you all considered your intent on whether or not to issue $1.5 million worth of industrial revenue bonds for the purpose of making improvements uh, to the hospital. These improvements that are anticipated uh, with this particular bond issue are rehabilitation and, and refurbishment of areas that indicate a significant investment as well as some new equipment for the hospital. And the hospital would then agree to be a tenant on a lease where the city would issue the bonds. The hospital would sign a lease to repay them. It is considered a special obligation of the city. 
if the hospital doesn't make the lease payment, the bondholders know the city's not in any way obligated to make it. It is, it is a special obligation. There's three steps in this process. We're at the second step, which is to consider whether or not tax abatement is appropriate for this project. In order to consider this, public notice has to be provided in the newspaper, which has been provided. The school district, the county are required by statute to be notified that you'll be holding a public hearing. You're required to have a public hearing. And the statute indicates that you must prepare some cost benefit analysis uh, to aid in your determining process. And that's where we are tonight. And I wanted to uh, take a minute to explain the cost benefit analysis that is prepared and how we've gotten here historically as the city of Andover. The city of Andover has a pretty strong history since the 1990s as it relates to improvements uh, with industrial revenue bonds. As I was driving out here tonight, it crossed my mind what uh, the city of Andover uh, looks like because of the industrial revenue bonds you have issued. Uh, you haven't issued uh, all that are requested, but you have issued some. Um, the original Speed Queen intended facility that is now Sherwin-Williams and all of the Sherwin-Williams plant was actually financed that way. Vornado Fan entirely, the Andover Healthcare Center, Andover Court, the Victoria Hall Falls Nursing Home, the recent portions of the Kansas Medical Center, the uh, Medical Office Building next door, the Flint Hills National Golf Course entirely with IRBs, uh, Andover Square, the original uh, retail center in Andover, uh, the Holiday Inn Express, uh, the Family Medical Clinic, uh, the Sunstone Apartments, and these are uh, the projects that I assisted on uh, when I was a young man as, as bond counsel and, and now very uh, lucky to be serving as your city attorney as well. Tonight's uh, process uh, includes a public hearing and uh, requires a cost-benefit analysis. The history of the cost-benefit analysis the city uses dates back to the 1990s. The cost-benefit analysis is prepared by the Kansas, was prepared by the Kansas League of Municipalities in the 90s to address a statutory requirement that a uh, city do some cost-benefit analysis before it grants abatement. Uh, there are, and since that time, numerous other models that have been developed uh, you can pay the Department of Commerce to uh, run a model. Uh, WSU Center for Economic Development, uh, you can pay them to run a model. Um, over the years, we have had developers uh, propose to use their own models and financial advisors that wanted to use their own models. Uh, historically, uh, beginning with Jeff Bridges, this, this was denied by the city. Uh, those models tend to show uh, more aggressive and better ratios and and he just decided that we're going to stick with the model we have because it seems to be conservative more conservative than all the other results we're getting in that way councils from time to time are are uh, comparing apples to apples uh, the model has been and continues to be criticized over the years uh, some of you may recall that uh, Wichita actually instituted the WSU Center's involvement in connection with an IRB it originally approved for Genesis and then there was some discussion over how this model doesn't adequately take into account an import factor, um, meaning that uh, uh, IRB, for instance, for Vornado fans where 99.9% .9 of those fans are sold somewhere else and that money's coming in uh, to Andover should be treated differently than a facility that is uh, located uh, in the city that attracts primarily people who were, would be serviced in the city. Uh, some other uh, criticisms include that it's really intended to uh, view a manufacturing analysis. It, 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 it takes into account uh, manufacturing jobs and it, it, by virtue of that, there's some criticism that the service jobs are different than manufacturing jobs. Typically that uh, by by historical standards in the 90s at least, that they're not as good, although the economy has somewhat evolved from that point. Um, there are some uh, flaws in the model, I think, going the other way too. Uh, I'll go over this with you, but the model assumes they're going to build it, whether they get the incentive or not, 
So it treats absolutely all the property tax that will be received from the facility as abated, meaning it treats it as a hard cost when if, of course, they don't build it, you, you wouldn't have that cost and you wouldn't have any of the benefits. So it kind of assumes they're going to build it and treats all of that as a cost and uh, then it compares the benefits. I suppose another a criticism of the model has been that it actually compares the total costs to the net benefits as opposed to preparing total costs to total benefits, meaning that it subtracts out all of the abatement before it compares the benefits to the costs, which include the abatement. Uh, some have argued that that means that it, it, it counts the costs twice, uh, but I, I think I can explain as we look at it uh, why that's appropriate, uh, particularly on the Kansas Medical Center project. Um, the, historically, we found it to be a conservative basis, uh, but I want everybody to understand that the model is what it is. Uh, I, I can't really control it or change its outcomes. We poll all of the governmental agencies and we ask them for the rates and constants and the mill levies that are included and we use what they provide us and we input those all into the model. Uh, we then uh, ask for estimates of performance from the IRB tenant, the developer, and uh, we take those inputs and unless they seem unreasonable, we put them in and we use them. Uh, where inputs are not requested or suggested, the model has a book that says if you don't have any other information, you use this. And uh, that's what we do. Uh, this includes things like inflation rate, percentage of employees who might buy a house. And in Butler County, uh, it has an economic multiplier in that it basically says that a job in Butler County is like a .48 of a real job in Sedgwick County. And what I'm telling you is that uh, that's because the kind of manufacturing jobs in the 90s that were located in Wichita were the desirable jobs. So basically there's a discount rate that's applied for Butler County. And I think you could argue Butler County, particularly Andover, looks a lot different than it did then as it relates to being a retail center. Um, so with the understanding that the batteries are not included, your mileage may vary, buyer beware, uh, and take this all with a grain of salt. This is just one piece of what you're considering as it relates uh, to IRBs. The law doesn't require that it come out favorably. It doesn't require you to not approve it. If it comes out unfavorably, it lets you make the decision. That's, that's the law. And I, uh, over the years, I've told people that I think it's more important what you want and what you don't want in your community and, and what you're willing to invest in. Uh, and I certainly wouldn't spend the money that's reflected in this cost-benefit analysis. So that, that's about the best uh, disclaimer I always give. With that uh, bit of history, if uh, you will turn with me to page 7 of the cost-benefit analysis, it's on page seven. The analysis uh, forecasts the costs and benefits to the city of Andover. And uh, you'll see that in column two on page 70, uh, it is suggesting that an abatement on this particular project for the Kansas Medical Center will uh, provide $15,192 worth of cost in the first year. That was its guess on what the taxes would be. Uh, with a total of $176,173 worth of taxes being abated over the life of the 10-year issue. Uh, it then takes into account, um, and, and, and I'm sorry I said cost, but see it's showing those as a benefit and in just a minute, if you'll look down to the property taxes abated, it's showing them as a cost. So it's taking and assuming the building gets built and you're going to have this benefit, and then it's subtracting them all out as abated taxes. It's, it's no coincidence in this case that they match perfectly. So all of the property taxes that are shown as a benefit or subtracted out as a cost to determine the net benefits that it will then compare to the property tax abatement, which I think makes it a pretty conservative model. Uh, you'll see it takes into account some sales taxes, utilities and utility franchise fees and other municipal revenues. 
The city of Andover over the years has done a remarkable job, quite frankly, in diversifying the sources of revenue that the city receives. Uh, between sales taxes and impact fees, you have uh, used user fees and other methods that have allowed you to sort of keep a cap as it is on, on property taxes. And so typically we would expect a city to perform better under cost benefit analysis than a school district. In fact, I do not recall ever doing a cost benefit analysis in which the school district shows a benefit because it is almost entirely property tax driven. Uh, they don't have uh, fees and charges uh, to, to change that. So it, it wouldn't be unusual and you would expect the school district uh, to be adversely impacted by property tax exemptions. However, in July of this year, not reflected in the model, the Kansas legislature changed the law on IRBs and has said that to the extent a school district has a local option mill levy, and the Andover School District has eight mills, that will not be abated. So even if you prove 100% abatement on a project, I want you all to understand that theoretically that is a win for the school district because they will still collect uh, eight mills that they weren't getting if it were not constructed. And so if you're comparing not having it to having it for the school district, they'll actually receive revenues. Here's the last thing on this particular project I have to say. Uh, I think the property taxes and the property taxes abated are probably uh, flawed. And the reason why is here we're not constructing a new facility with new square footage that's going to translate into taxes abated based on the investment. Uh, here the taxes abated are actually likely to be much less because it is unlikely that the county appraiser will go out to the Kansas Medical Center and say, gee, this facility is now worth $1.5 million more because they've really dressed it up. That, that's, that's not how valuation works. Valuation works on what the fair market value of the property is. So when you're not adding any square footage, uh, the model probably overstates the amount of property taxes that would come from this. That's okay because I just told you that which it puts in as property taxes, it takes out as taxes abated. So even if it, even if it got that wrong here where the Kansas Medical Center is requesting 100% abatement for 10 years, that should be okay. If you then look at page eight, one other element of the model, I don't purport to defend the model, obviously. I, I, just, I just put in the data we're provided uh, and we, we don't try to, we, we try to, to be as correct as we can, but we don't try to mimic it. But the model does then try to take the net benefits, or if it's costing money, uh, it does that. Here you'll see that the public benefits over 10 years exceed the public costs in every year with uh, net benefits in year one of $3,600 and, and net benefits in year 10 of $27,000. However, it tries to present value those net benefits, which of course reduce over a period of time. A dollar today is not of the same value as a dollar 10 years from now. Uh, it uses an inflation factor of, uh, I think it's 2.25%. It has a discount rate of 5.5%. Um, and so then it tries to compute in the last column the present value of taxes abated and or incentives. And I've just had you look at the city of Andover. So if you were to turn back to page five, you would see the present value of net benefits to received over the next 10 years, uh, then compared to the present value of incentives and taxes abated. And for the city of Andover, uh, it basically forecasts a cost-benefit analysis, which would about be a wash, uh, meaning that uh, over a 10-year period, if you present value all the dollars, that which is, was abated uh, was returned by some other source. Uh, you would not be surprised to find 
that uh, it doesn't forecast any uh, benefits for the school district, USD 385. However, to address that, uh, there is a footnote, of course, that points out that eight mills based on the valuation would be about $1,400 a year that they'll receive that they're not receiving now if you were to use the valuation the model's using or, or a value of $10,002.54 because of the change in the law. You have two of these tonight, and I'm not going to repeat anything I just said when we get to the second one. So if you'll, if you'll remember all of that, uh, Steve Hadley is here from the Kansas Medical Center to answer any questions you have, and it is necessary for you to have a public hearing. But before I take my seat, do you have any questions of me? I'm afraid to. <laughs> <laughs> Good job, JT. Before I open this public hearing, Mr. Hadley, do you, you want to offer any comments? You don't have to. Don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, this time I'd like to open up a public hearing concerning the uh, 1124 West 21st Street IRB issue um, regarding KMC. Ask if anybody would like to speak. There being none, I will close the public hearing and move the discussion up here to the bench. Council, what you have before you is a resolution approving the Ad Valorem property tax exemption. And uh, as presented, actually, for the Founders Real Estate Project. Mr. Mayor, I would move uh, a, to approve a resolution of the governing body of the city of Andover, Kansas approving an ad valorem property tax exemption for property acquired with the proceeds of certain uh, industrial revenue bonds as presented. Second. Motion by CR, second by Grave to approve the resolution as presented. Further discussion? A little clarification, please. Certainly. This is not the entire property because it already exists. It's just it's the emergency room area that they are remodeling. Is that correct? Mr. Hadley, would you like to answer that? The, the, uh, the first step in this is actually remodeling the intermediate area, okay. um, pre-op, post-op. And then in this also, we will start a remodeling of what you spoke to, the ER, and some other projects down there. That will come later in the year, however. But I guess my question is, this doesn't take away all the taxes that have been Absolutely not. Case. No. It's just taking away this area that's been worked on. Now. Yeah, and it'll only take away the improvement in value right. to what we do. The base taxes will remain, if I understand correctly, JT. That's correct. Yeah. When that hospital was first constructed, um, the physician owners did not request uh, any industrial revenue bonds, and that hospital pays well in excess of a half million dollars a year in property tax. So that will still be um, collected as usual. Well, I un understood that happened to them the first time around, so I certainly want to try to help them out this time. Well, that's, that's it. They, you know, had they come to the city of Andover and asked for property tax abatements, um, we would have had to strongly consider them at the time. That's, that's a feather in our cap. Uh, for the city of Andover. And a lot of the communities that have facilities like that, that do, they're 100% they're abated for as long as possible, but uh, they didn't ask for it. Um, we mentioned it, and they still didn't want it, so we're, we're good with that. So, um, Did that answer your question? Yes. Okay, Thanks. so we have a motion and a second to approve the resolution as presented. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Item number 11, uh, we have uh, a very similar issue. Uh, this is concerning an industrial revenue bond and ad valorem property tax exemption for 1400 Teradyne Street. Um, do you want to add anything to this or not? Actually, Mr. Mayor, uh, with all of the previous disclaimers and the same information, 
The only thing I would help you uh, look at would be the exact same pages in the cost benefit analysis for this particular application. If you look at page seven, you'll see that the property taxes are taken as a benefit as if the building was actually constructed and then uh, they're subtracted back out as taxes abated. Uh, it's important for you to note here, they don't magically match. And that's because of uh, other factors that the model's taking into account from employment, uh, indirect employees, uh, potential spending, although the difference is only $112 in year one, here, the model is beginning to try to absorb not only the construction jobs that are created by this investment, but also uh, the employment that was estimated by the developer. And so if you then look at page eight, uh, just like we did on the other one, you'll see that the model is trying to forecast the present value of uh, the net benefits uh, they are significant here in year one because of impact fees that you have on your sewer plant and other uh, matters uh, for a facility of this kind. Um, and then on page five, uh, it intends to forecast the uh, present value of the incentives and taxes abated over the next 10 years and determine a cost benefit analysis. Uh, here again, you will uh, see that uh, it is a substantial uh, projected benefit to the city of Andover with the payback period uh, uh, estimated to occur in the first year on a cost benefit ratio of 2.41. But as I previously described, it uh, would show a cost to the school district. Uh, again, a reminder, the model is comparing it as if it's built and done and will be built uh, to uh, if you give the tax abatement. Uh, as a reminder, uh, we have footnoted here because the school district will actually collect eight mills if it's constructed or $19,651.92 additional over it not being constructed and uh, the model just hasn't yet been modified to take that new law into effect. Uh, that's really all I needed to say about this one. Just if you have any questions, you can let me know. Mr. Detter, do you, do you have any background on this you'd like to offer? Well, I think I have a PowerPoint that hopefully we'll get up here in a second that I would like to go over. Be because here's my take on this entire uh, cost benefit analysis. It's a state law that we have to do it. It's a model that says one size fits all. You can't possibly use a model like this to analyze the over 600 cities we have in this state and the 105 counties uh, and suggest that that model is going to bring precise outcomes of the way this things work. Again, someone at the state level you know, there's probably some good reason decided that you need to have one of these before you gave a property tax abatement because they want the public to be well aware of the cost of giving an, ab uh, an abatement. And I'm not going to quibble with that. I'm just going to tell you that it does not necessarily have a good analysis for our community. It's required. And what I've tried to do here in the PowerPoint is talk about specifically our community and what I think this project uh, how it reflects on our community and what it can do for our community and maybe some of the downsides of it. So if we could go with the first. The uh, incentive is projected to be in excess of $3 million. That's the tax abatement and the 684000 projected of building materials sales tax exemption you'll get. Meaning it's, if it's a $20 million project, I would guess that there's going to be $8 million of materials or so. <clears throat> And again, these are all projections, but that's what I would say the community, the school district, the community college, the county, and the city are going to wind up essentially giving up in taxes. 
giving up without something here becomes a relative term too. But that's essentially the tax incentive we're providing this complex. Onto the next page, <clears throat> here's the reasons I would say um, we give tax incentives. What'd you say? Do you want the light off? It's pretty small, right? No, it's just small. Okay. That's all right. I can pick it up. We have a county next to us that has 40 mills lower in taxes, relatively. Uh, the school district, uh, if you're in Sedgwick County, in the uh, Andover School District, it's a little bit different. But every time we look at a project like this, a $20 million project, Taxes across the county line are between 69,000 and I have 103 in here. Again, those are projections. We would not be competitive in this community if we didn't give IRBs, as JT has suggested we've done in the past. I wonder if we would have a Flint Hills National. I wonder if we'd have a Holiday Inn. I, you know, quite, quite frankly, you could go down the list of all of the retail benefits. And not only that, on top of that, in the last five years, We've expanded the neighborhood revitalization plan. In, in 12 and 13, we gave it to 100% of the properties in the city. The school didn't participate in that one. And recently, we expanded that to give, uh, the, the school was involved and we've targeted some areas, but a few new developments ha have been targeted to, to help them along with that. The primary thing here is Sedgwick County, although they have 75% or so of the students going to our college, doesn't have to pay 20 mils like we do for the community college. And that puts us at a structural disadvantage in uh, the city of Andover. And all we can do is try to give incentives that help us compete in that situation. So if we could go on to the next slide. So to start with, over 10 years, we would project about $1.4 million in in lieu of taxes. Every abatement creates an in lieu of tax. This uh, has a 10 year abatement starting at 100% for the first two years, then going to 80 and declining from there down to 20. Um, we would also project that the USD 385, because of this rule that the legislator enacted, uh, would uh, get about $165,000, again, a projection over the next 10 years. The city, is going to get, and this is where some people would say we're not competitive with multifamily, $500,000 in fees from a 120 unit development. We get uh, 81,000, I think it's $635 for park impact fees, eight, over $800 per unit for street impact fees, over $2,000 per unit for the wastewater system. And right now, although we're considering raising this, we're looking at about $65,000 in building permit fees. Then I'm estimating, I think this is a little low, that we'll get about uh, $450,000 in uh, additional sewer fees because every unit in there pays $35 a month, just like you do as a homeowner, equaling up to $420 a year, times by 120, and you're getting close to over 50,000, well, you're, you are getting over $50,000 a year. And by the way, that doesn't matter if that unit is occupied. We charge it anyway. So you could have, they can have start off with 80 of those 120 units. They're still paying for 35 bucks a month for 120 units. Again, from the landlord side of this and a few other people, we get a lot of criticism over this. But in this case, you know, it's going to be pretty lucrative for us. Could go to the next slide. Here are some of the concessions that Sunflower has made in this IRB agreement. Each tenant residing in the complex will receive a social membership at Teradyne Country Club. We've talked about that. We've put it in as part of the IRB agreement, meaning that they could be putting in jeopardy their tax abatement if they don't, in fact, follow through on that. Now, I think they're gonna have an agreement with the seller of the property and others that would cover that, but we wanted to make sure we put it as a part of this tax abatement. Within two years of the project certificate of occupancy, Sunflower was certified to the city that 80% of the all residents are 55 years of age or older. One of the concerns has been is the impact on the school district and that we're gonna have younger people, uh, more people in their parking. We want this to be an active living 
uh, development Senior. for seniors. And we are putting that in as a requirement as well to maintain the tax abatement. <clears throat> Sunflower will comply with all relative codes of the city of Andover, Kansas, including site planning. Now, typically what we have to do is take someone to municipal court or possibly file a lawsuit. We haven't had to do that very much. But again, if they don't provide enough parking or all the other requirements of a site planning, uh, the site planning requirements and other codes, they're jeopardizing their tax abate. Um, all non-abated taxes, the payment in lieu of taxes will be paid by December 20th and May 10th on time, not you know, late, uh, not to where they're gonna be paying interest. They've agreed, they've covenanted to say they will pay these on times. In addition, all of our sewer fee will be paid on time. And that's something we can go back and look at the abatement if it's not done and suggest it's in jeopardy too for doing that. And by the way, it has not been uncommon that we've had people who have just not paid a whole year of sewer fees. Then we've had to turn around and assess that to the property taxes and that doesn't help our cash flow at all. So this is a big, uh, I don't know if I wanna say concession, but a big demand on our part that uh, is good financially for the city. The tenant will become a member or negotiate in good faith and enter into a reasonable common area maintenance agreement with the Highlands at Teradyne Homeowners Association. My preliminary indications from the HOA at Highland talking to a, the, the realtor involved is that they would rather negotiate the common area maintenance agreement for the private drive and all the common maintenance area agreements uh, issues they have. And uh, Sunflower has agreed to do that. Um, I think I had one more on there. Can we flip back? <laughs> the tenant will obtain and maintain a partnership level membership with the Andover Chamber of Commerce. That's a $5,000 membership with the Chamber of Commerce. They've agreed to do this because they want to be a part of the community. It, it's uh, part of the abatement. I don't know if we've ever asked anybody in an IRB for this or quite frankly, quite a few of these other things. I do remember Flint Hills National was dependent on developing houses. There were some requirements of that, but typically uh, we haven't gone to a developer with a half a dozen requirements that we're asking them to add into an IRB agreement. Can we go on to the next slide? Uh, financially for the community, I believe the reasons for the abatements are several, but Number one is we just passed a $187 million bond issue in this community for new schools. And what, when we went and did that bond, we said in order to keep our taxes levy, uh, level, you know, about less, a little less than three mils, that our taxes won't go up, we would grow the valuation of our community approximately 50% over the next 17 years. Now that may sound easy, but you know, Post 2008, uh, it's not automatic. And what I would suggest, suggest you is we can't pass on $20 million projects if we're gonna hold to those kind of commitments. We put the full faith and credit of everybody in the Andover School District behind it, and we're gonna have to pay it. It's just a matter of do we have the tax base to keep a level mill levy through the life of it. I think it's a great project, but it falls upon you as the city council to find a way to create economic development to finance these things. That's just the nature of the, th of, of the way uh, local government works. Um, Butler County and the college have debt to be paid that's dependent on a growing tax base. Certainly we do. We have a, a police station that has seven more years on it and that payment will climb. And it would be helpful if we could expand our tax base in order to make those payments. Uh, new developments provide electric franchise fees that obviously will help our payment on the $7 million, ours portion of it, $3.5, $3.7 million of undergrounding burial lines. That's where we're getting that money from is electric franchise fees. Uh, new residents obviously support business in Andover. New residents provide additional sales tax uh, for street improvements. The sale of land will provide more capital to the Terranine and Golf and Country Club, hopefully to invest back in the club. Social memberships, again, are going to be a part of uh, the uh, complex and the deal made with the existing property owner. Uh, it creates stability by potentially increasing the value of the club, the financial stability of the club, which in turn creates uh, stability in terms of property values in the area and expands our tax base. 
I will say there are people opposed to it. If we go to the next slide, we can talk a little bit about some of the opposition. We have petitions in front of you that were given during the, uh, the first zoning hearing where you have pretty much the entire uh, portion of Teradyne Estates, Teradyne II, and the Highlands at Teradyne who are, appear to be against the project. Um, some have claimed there's a lack of compliance with the comprehensive plan with this idea, impact on traffic. I will say that we plan on doing a major multi-million dollar improvement to 159th Street and the KTA Bridge that I think will handle any traffic impacts of this development and quite frankly the new land that's been bought by the school district at 13th Street um, will have more traffic on it so it'll be more, more than needed to improve 159th, I agree, but I think our improvements will handle that. Uh, there's been a suggestion that there's been, well, there'll be negative impacts on property values in the area and multifamily zoning is not appropriate for the area. I just want to, I'll just want to touch on what the comprehensive plan I believe says about <coughs> multifamily housing and specifically uh, senior housing. So if we could go to the next slide. It identifies the US 54 400 corridor, the 21st Street corridor, the retail node at Andover Road, and Central Avenues as location for multifamily. But it doesn't limit it to that. It, it goes on to say, in all locations, multifamily housing fr should front on a true grid system rather than internal roads and parking lots. I would call 159th Street a grid street. And the fact it, it is going to be accessed by a private road. <clears throat> But the idea of this was somebody wouldn't put an apartment complex way in the back of a subdivision, having to access it off of Crescent Lakes Drive or Teradyne Drive. It, it, it wasn't to say you couldn't have a private drive going on to 159th Street. It was trying to keep us from sticking this in the middle of a subdivision, which would be mostly residential around it. At least that's been my explanation of it when they, when they, they were here developing. Uh, the plan continues, housing choice and affordability can also be enhanced through PUD provisions of the city's zoning regulations. The purpose of the PUD district is to encourage innovation in residential, commercial, industrial development by permitting greater variety and flexibility in type, design, and layout of buildings. It also states there are residents who would prefer to live in another type of housing. Examples include older residents who have, mo who have moved and over to be closer to children and grandchildren, and residents who have moved to Andover for the schools but want to stay in Andover after their children have left the school system. That was a group who came together four or five years ago and defined what the community uh, values are. And one of them was we wanted to keep people in this uh, community who have had kids leave school or we wanted to attract them to be closer to their families. So I think the project meets the spirit and intent of those statements in the comprehensive plan. We can go on to the last slide. <clears throat> Councilmember Schneider came to me about a week ago and said, you know, this is a difficult decision. I have residents in the surrounding community who don't want it. How do you make a decision on something like this? And I, it's tough. I'm not saying it's easy to tell you know, all the neighbors that they have to accept something that they don't appear to want. But I would suggest that you need to weigh these maybe in percentages. The opposition, I could count as much as 40%. You know, you, the people in the area just don't want it. On the other hand, I think the financial impacts are clearly positive. And I, you know, I take that to be about 20% of what your decision should be and I think it meets the comprehensive plan, which I think should be another 20%. Then there are the intangibles. I've heard it suggested that rental housing is not, doesn't fit in here. I could see what, why people would feel that way. Um, on the other hand, uh, I think there are some advantages to the school district for infrastructure development, particularly the sewer that's going to be developed there will probably save the school district $100,000 on their project on 13th Street. Finally, I think you have to talk about the developer, and that's uh, a lot of what's been discussed today. In Andover, we have had many variety of developers. You know, some of them have been good, some of them have been bad. Uh, but Sunflower, although their history is brief, is involved in a lot of different projects. 
They're 25% involved in the Spaghetti Works project that the city of Wichita, Wichita has decided to give $23 million in incentives to. Um, and uh, they, ha they have decided that they're a worthwhile partner. I would say that Mr. Floodman has been the point person on this. And I don't think anybody could say he has lacked passion to make this project work. I think he's approached everybody in Teradyne he possibly could to explain the project and, and try to answer any questions he had. You know, his reputation, if you read some, some of the things that he did at KU, was the, same, was the same way. He was involved in some very high for, profile projects there, including the men's basketball dormitory, which believe you me, uh, several people in that area care deeply about, and I'm sure he re received a lot of scrutiny on it. And so I think the gentleman shows the passion and the drive to want to make a project like this work, um, and then has the backing behind him otherwise. Um, so, you know, I, I think overall, um, we have a developer who's committed to the project. Finally, I would just add this, that I think ultimately tips this to make this development worth doing, and I would recommend to you is almost, well, I can't think of one. We have had to provide public financing for infrastructure improvements for almost every development in, in this uh, community that has gotten Flint Hills National. Certainly, we've had to provide uh, public infrastructure for Dillon's to be successful, the YMCA, even the hospital, who even though they're not getting tax abatements, we had to do public financing to reach them with improvements. As far as I know, this development isn't asking for any money in public financing. We have zero risk when it comes to having to issue debt and expecting that they're going to pay us back special assessments. Almost everywhere else throughout this city, that's the bargain we make. That's what we have to do to develop. But in this case, there has been no request for public financing. And I think that uniqueness is something that we should all take uh, in great consideration. And that's the end of my presentation. Mr. Mayor, do you mind if I ask a question? Sure, go ahead. Okay. Can you, go back, can you keep the slides up and maybe go back to the slides that showed all the benefits? Um, that they're uh, they're promising their concessions into the IRB agreement yeah specifically okay. the one that, that um, they they said that everyone would be a member um, somebody called me today and asked me about that specific piece of it and um, I didn't have a good answer for them so the question was if the uh, property were to sell if the property were to sell prior to, and I'll, I'll add this in, prior to the 10 years being up, would the new owners be required to continue the requirement of? I can answer that. Okay. The answer is no, not technically. But if they want to keep the tax abatement, they would have to. That's my question. So the tax yeah. abatement would disappear. This is, those conditions are tied directly to the tax abatement. So in year five, they want to sell, they sell to somebody else who doesn't apply for new tax abatements or to, to keep the same existing schedule, which could happen. They could, ha they could apply, um, which you wouldn't have to approve. Um, but if they, if they sell it and the new buyer doesn't want to agree to those conditions, the tax abatement goes away. The full, tax is, the full property tax is levied immediately. Certainly. Well, I read that the, um, the social memberships, if property were to sell, and that would be if... Is your microphone on? Oh. Push that. There you there. go. Go ahead. Um, if the property were to sell, not, not the apartment complex, but the Teradyne Country Club, if, if they were to s sell to mm -hmm. someone, that those social memberships were no longer required? Did I read that wrong? I mean, I, I think that's true because, of course, Sunflower Development isn't going to just assume that they're going to maintain that same agreement with an owner that they're not didn't make a deal with. I mean, I think they have every right to uh, 
uh, scrutinize who the new owners are and see if they want to uh, maintain that. I think that's okay. pretty so reasonable. Okay, so there might, be, I mean, there would be incentive right, to right. continue that. Um, to me, one of the benefits would be ongoing revenue for right. the country club with this membership, but if it was really only going to exist for 10 years, so what happens oh, right, on right. year I mean, 11, 12, et cetera? We, so sure, we I was just curious because it does state it's only during uh, while it's owned by the current owner of the country club. So in two years, if, if he sells, that whole They have a decision to make whether they want to uh, adhere to that, but okay. it is their option at that point. Any other questions? Uh, I'm sorry, I have to add one clarification to what's been said so far. There's an assumption here that, that was made that they could sell the apartment complex. Uh, the, my RRB lease doesn't allow that. Right. If they wanted to sell the apartment complex, they'd need the city council's consent to assign the lease. And if they didn't get that assignment, their option would be to retire the bonds, which would end the abatement. So the assumption that they could sell the apartment complex and keep the abatement uh, is is not is is not correct. They would need the city council's but, consent but to do that. You're clear. She's talking about selling the club. I'm Troy not. Wasn't. That's not what Troy was asking, Troy was and I, I didn't want to interrupt no, Council no, Member sorry, Hale when sorry. when the initial question was asked. So, your yeah, your question, uh, Caroline, was about selling the club, and 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 but there's no RBs on the club, and we'd have no control over that. I, I just didn't want anybody assuming that. That, that that would be within their sole authority to sell this to a different developer and and then just keep the abatement without asking the city council for the assignment of lease. We, we don't allow that. Um, I'm going to tell you the reason we don't allow it is because if somebody comes in and makes this deal and, and someone says, this is the developer I like, if they could just they could just leave after one year and keep the abatement, that would just increase the value of their sale price. And, and it would encourage what I call develop and leave scenarios. So our, our IRB lease doesn't allow that uh, without consent. And actually, we've had some people request to do that before, and the city council uh, has decided, I think, to consent. Uh, I don't remember which ones precisely. I just, I just wanted a complete answer to Council Member Tabor's question. Thank you, JT. Mr. Floodman, would you like to make a few comments before I open the public hearing? I would, thank you. Mm -hmm. Again, my name is Banks Floodman, and I'm with Sunflower <coughs> Development Group. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak here again about what I feel is a very, very exciting project. Um, I don't enjoy doing this. I, I wouldn't be here doing this if it wasn't a project I believed in. I was approached a couple of years ago by one of the owners of Teradyne. Um, we, when I was being with Sunflower, we've had the opportunity to work with a lot of great individuals, but one of them specifically, um, one of our partners, um, who I've alluded to this project numerous times before, developed uh, Liberty at Shoal Creek. Um, and when, when I was approached by Teradyne Ownership Group, we started to brainstorm about what we think could be an absolutely beneficial project to not only the club, but the neighborhood. Um, having expertise, and relationships um, with this sort of living facility that I'll show you, um, we came up with an idea um, that we think is a very, very long-term sustainable idea that would be advantageous to the neighborhood, city, and Teradyne Country Club. Um, so we obviously went through the process and, and came up with a concept that we, we feel very, very good about. Um, it is important to note as I go through these slides um, that it does, Liberty at Shoal Creek um, is taken, is going to end up taking about 24 months to lease up. Right now they're at 70% lease. <coughs> Liberty at Shoal Creek opened for individuals to move in in January 2017, so a year ago from today. Their, their ribbon cutting was in May of 2017 in which um, they actually were done with construction at that point. And again, they're now close to seven, just under 70% occupied. Um, and e all the information that we keep understanding and seeing with this sort of facility, you're gonna have anywhere from 15 to 25% leased up prior to your construction being done. 
and then you're going to lease about five to seven percent every month after that. And so we have a, and a lot of that is, is and there is a wait list at Liberty at Shoal Creek right now that has, that it's actually the wait list consists of individuals moving both from out of town, some locally as well, that are selling their houses to move in this facility. Um, and so we'll go ahead and hop into the project and I'll show you a little bit more about it. I know a lot of you have seen this before. That's just a little, a little, a little background on Sunflower. And this is, and this is the concept we're looking at. Um, work with, work with the city um, and Teradyne in the neighborhood to, to create a cr common interest in a long-term um, success for, for the country club. Um, our goal is to inject 120 to 125. Um, individuals, high net worth individuals into this facility um, that want to call it home, that want to engage in the community, that want to golf, that want to enjoy um, all the fantastic amenities that Andover has to offer. Um, this will be targeted specifically at 55 plus. Um, you know, that, that's, that, you know, like, like Mr. Detter mentioned, that, that is going to be a requirement and something that that we are that we feel very very strongly in and, and will lead to the success of this project um, some of the amenity packages that that we've created um, things that i believe that give gives this project a competitive advantage from anything in the area um, whether that's social memberships um, use of the tennis facilities pool etc i think individuals are going to look forward to calling this place home um, while helping helping revenues of both the country club and the Hereford House. That's just kind of the layout. Um, the club is, is just there to the southeast. That's just the current kind of short game area. The, 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 um, the, the driving range is just across 159 there. Um, I think it's important to note that um, one of the important aspects of this purchase is it allows current ownership to pay down their debt. Um, and hopefully provide additional amenities to the Teradyne um, membership group. A, a very important thing for this project is, is to embrace Teradyne's colonial style architecture. Um, I'm from Wichita, I'm from the area I grew up not too far away from this country club, and it's a beautiful country club. But how can you complement it? Um, that'll be very important when we put together the the final renderings for this facility is to complement it as, as well as we possibly can. We want this to be a destination. I know there's just a Hereford House there now, but we want people to invite individuals, friends, families, etc., <clears throat> to this facility so they can go out and golf together. You know, Teradyne, when it was built, I believe, was supposed to be a hotel. It was. And, and I believe it's zoned for an additional 100 keys right this minute. So you could add another 100 rooms right now. But it was, it was created to be a destination for golfers, a place to come. In the comprehensive plan, it's referred to as a resort. Resorts typically have different sort of living options, et cetera. We feel like this plays into that comprehensive plan and, and, and using the terminology resort when it refers to Teradyne Country Club. But, you know, we want people to invite friends, family to stay here with them. Golf, enjoy Teradyne Country Club. It's a great course. Everybody knows that. We want, to, we want to reserve a unit for existing members. So they have, when they have their friends and families come in, they don't have to stay at the hotel down the street in Wichita. They can stay right there on the, on the country club and go to Hereford House and enjoy, enjoy dinner together. These are just some renderings that we have up to this point. Again, trying to stick with the colonial style architecture. just kind of an image of kind of the entrance and how, how it could possibly look. That's just a, a view that, that uh, had somebody ask for, so I, I wanted to provide that for them, and, and so that kind of gives you an idea how it would look facing west. Those are just some distance. This is just a, 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 I like to call it a very similar project that's occurring in Lawrence, Kansas right now. Um, on Albemarle Country Club, now called the Jayhawk Club, where there's, you see the, the, main, um, the main area right there, the clubhouse in the middle, and then you've got some multifamily and the house is down there uh, to the south. Um, but they're trying to create a community. Um, and I think that's exactly what we're trying to do here. Creating an active and social experience, 
We want people to be engaged. We want people to be active. We want people to be having fun. We want wine lockers. We want energy. And, and that's, that's what we think we'll be able to provide with this facility. High-end finishes. Um, again, this is, everybody's seen the cost. This is going to be a very expensive facility, and, and we're not going to take shortcuts. These are some of, some of the um, kind of the, the details of it. Um, we want to hide the parking. Um, again, create ways to engage the country club. I mentioned the unit, um, economic value. Um, there'll be o well over $500,000 of um, initial um, sewer impact fees, city fees, et cetera. Eight on-site jobs. You know, this number has changed. Um, initially, it was on a slide. It said four to seven jobs. Um, and as we really dive into it and start to say, you know what, we're going to want transportation, concierge service, a nutritionist, um, maintenance, property managers, they add up. And so we feel very confident in that number. That's just the overall cost of the, uh, the project at this point. We have had two bids, so it's not just a number that I've, I've created. I think it's important of what this facility will not be. Um, it will not be a daycare, preschool, um, Section 8, low-income housing, um, halfway house, um, and it will not be a hotel, which we don't think would be the highest and best use for this, for this land. And again, those are kind of the three areas I think it's imperative for us to touch on if this project's going to be successful, um, is to work closely with the stakeholders <coughs> to uh, determine um, you know, the highest and best use, which we feel we have, um, and offer a, a, a country club style experience that is not available anywhere in this area. So. That's all I got. Thank you. Questions? Actually, two other things, if I could just mention really quickly. I, I, one thing I looked at is, is I went back and did some digging, and I think in 2012 there was the envisioning process that the city came up with. Um, and I think one of the main areas of concern in that process uh, highlighted was, was, was the lack of, of active senior living. And so not only do I feel that this ties into the comprehensive plan, but of the envisioning process of 2012. Thank you. I've got a couple questions. Yep. Uh, could you tell me slightly more about this liberty at Shoal Creek, what project what state is that? Is that Missouri? That's in Missouri. Yep. And what golf course is that adjacent to? It's not on a golf course, sir. It's a, it's a square facility with an with a courtyard in the middle. Okay. It's got you know games. It's very active. Very similar what, to this. What about be. the one that you mentioned in Lawrence? Uh, that's that. That's just that's just multifamily. That's going to be, that could be college students. There's going to be some senior aspects as well. So that'll be a that'll be a lot of different types of, um, living in that in those facilities. And then one, one practical question, you probably said this before, but husband and wife comes in, do they both have to be over 55? Does one of them have to be over 55? What, what are the rules? One in each unit has to be above the age of 55. So one would have to be 55. So if you're married and you've got um, he or she is 51, it would be, that would be fine. And these are the fair housing laws. There's no discrimination or anything like that. Ms. Okay. Mr. Thank Fledman you. might Caroline. not be back up later, so maybe I have a question that might ahead. be ahead of what he's done. Um, earlier, when I was looking at everything, yeah. I did not see something that I read in a report today that you, you put a summary together for us, and I read that one. Um, a concern I had had was that this was not going to provide any covered parking or garage parking and now I'm reading that there is some aspect of that and can you explain that to me is that available for everyone or is that an extra fee or where did that happen and there will be a, a fee associated with that but but our goal is to give you know we'll have roughly 91 um, garages at this point not carports um, you know garages with with stone and, and that look good. So, so be some nine. of the earlier renderings that w I saw mm -hmm. just showed open parking. So are those like... I'll, I'll go back to it here so you can just to give you an idea. So if you look kind of a, a, just around, around the outside of the club there or the outside <laughs> of the facility, 
those those rectangle, oh. you, you can see the cup, the, the garage park, and that will be kind of around the entire facility. Okay. You know, and it has that always been there, and that I just not noticed it before. Uh, you know, I don't want to say that, but it, yes, no. it, we, we've had it. We've had it there. There may have been there may have been an early early rendering where it was not. So you may be you may be right. Okay. Um, but you know, it also presents a little bit of a buffer between 35 Highway and the facility as well. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, at this time, I'd like to open up the public hearing. Susan, um, did you did you make cards or something? I did, and I do believe that they have uh, filled them out. Perfect. It's just we're we're a little un unaccustomed to having so many people speak. So that's awesome. If you just leave them on the podium, that'd be great. Or um, but uh, let's keep it fashionly. Um, if you will raise your hand, I will recognize you, Mr. Gillespie. You can go first. <clears throat> I want to thank Mr. Floodman for his service to KU basketball. <laughs> um, I'd make a difference in one of his comments. He says we're creating a community. No, he's trying to alter a community. It's not a community that uh, needs renovation. It's not blighted. Doesn't need beautification. It's not in need of historic <clears throat> renovation or a drain on city finances or reputation. And it's not something where we need low income housing. That's Sunflower's expertise. Those are not the things Teradyne is. <clears throat> I am LaRue Gillespie at 1123 Teradyne Court here in Andover. The Teradyne community is a golf course and clubhouse surrounded by homes. <clears throat> that's the way it has been, that's the way it was designed, and that's the requirement today. A golf community surrounded by homes. Uh, as you've heard before, I've submitted a number of petitions saying we do not want this in our community. At Teradyne, that is there. Uh, some owners of 83 Teradyne homes have said, no, we do not want that. That's 82% of all the owners in Teradyne Estates. I have uh, 15 owners of what we normally call Teradyne II saying the same thing. And on January 2nd, I submitted petitions of six more from Highland of Teradyne, as you've heard before. The community does not want apartments built right next to their homes, particularly those who are right across the street within walking distance of 25 steps from their homes. <clears throat> In summary, kind of briefly, the neighbors of the pr proposed apartment overwhelmingly object. It isn't some people. It isn't half the people. It's overwhelmingly object to having apartments built right near their houses. <clears throat> and by further logic there, because they object to that, they object to getting industrial revenue bonds to fund such a project. One of the things you people will look at there it says IRBs. We're not talking IRBs. We're talking about industrial revenue bonds. <clears throat> That's a means to bring new jobs to a community, if you will, new industry to a community. And council has already talked about a number of examples where that has been happened. You've used it the way it was designed to be used, to bring business, to bring money, to bring jobs to the community there. Yes, you can use those funds for a few other things there, but that's the purpose of an industrial revenue fund. And apartments <coughs> are not industrial. I'm an engineer, KU engineer, used to using mathematical models and program models with lots of variables. Council has talked about there are a lot of variables in here and a lot of things that they have to use that they can't vary. But there's no one out there developing multi-million dollar projects in industry that will accept the result of a computer run one time with one set of variables. 
you run different variables and look at the results, and different variables and look at the results, and you develop confidence limits that the answer is somewhere between these two numbers. And I submit that what you've been given is flawed because it only addresses <clears throat> one set of numbers, not the bigger picture. Does that make sense? Some of the variables you need to run again at a high level, low level, and get the overall picture of how this works out. It's called confidence limits. Some of us don't believe this project is going to be successful. Yes, we think a building could be built. But in 10 years, we think it will be downscaled because we don't believe it will be successful. And that's after talking to realtors and developers who share that same comment to us. I haven't found a one that thought it was going to be successful other than Mr. Floodman. The calculated impact, if you will, on the state of Kansas is totally unreasonable because it assumes that we're bringing money to Kansas, <clears throat> all right? We're not. The people moving in there and some of Mr. Fledgeman's comments are coming locally to one spot. We're not bringing people from Florida and Texas. We're not bringing new money in like Boeing would if they established a new facility here. Those numbers for the Kansas impact, if it was business here, new jobs here, that would be correct. We're moving money from point A in Kansas to point B in Kansas, and those numbers aren't right. And the same thing in terms of the county, Butler County and Andover, benefiting so much from visitors, guests, and even people living in those, that facility. That facility is within a few feet of the county line. And if you're like me, I probably spend most of my money in Sedgwick County, not in Butler County. Shame on you. <laughs> I don't have a Cabello's here. You don't have a Best Buy here. We don't have those things. Yes, because we don't have enough rooftops here to, to attract them. Understand. Understand the reason there. But the analysis assumes that the majority of that money is going to be spent in this county and this city, and I think that's wrong and that's another flaw. And that's why you want to try different variables to look at the total impact. <clears throat> I don't know of another town that our size that uses industrial revenue bonds to fund apartments. There may be some. There are reasons to do that when you've got a real problem like the spaghetti factory, an old place that needs to be rebuilt in a giant city, but not in a small city like Andover. I would ask a question and I would like an answer from the city. Does any person on city staff or who gets city pay or any elected official benefit from the, this industrial bond request? And I'd like to be that. I'd like for that to be a, a matter of record. City's so bond attorney does. Okay. So his comments influence. You want to answer? That? You can tell him what your fee structure is. Uh, off the <clears throat> excuse me, off the top of my head, I don't know what my industrial revenue bond fee schedule would be. I, I haven't even uh, checked, but I do get paid. Uh, to be bond counsel through the through the bond proceeds for the city um, I'm hoping you didn't interpret anything I've said as a suggestion to vote one way or the other on this by the way I, I, I actually have the luxury of not living in Andover and I think that that helps me be objective but but certainly uh, Mr. Luru is correct that the city attorney benefits if you would ultimately decide to issue revenue bonds because that is work for which I will get paid. Thank you, and I'd like that to be part of the record as it's recorded later. Known fact. Okay, but it isn't known to the public. It is now. Thank you. <clears throat> that pretty well covers what I have to say, if you will, and I appreciate the time there. I've tried to keep it short on my part there. I've given a number of reasons there why I think, and there's many others in the community like I say, if a project of this nature needs to be done, if it's worth doing, it needs to be doing not with city money, just like the medical center wasn't done with city money in the past there. It needs to pay for itself from the start, 
we need to be bringing something in that creates jobs. Thank you. Mr. Gillespie, I've got a couple of questions for you. You're, you're indicating that you don't think that this apartment project is uh, a good idea. In the long term, that's right. And that's based on me what, talking to three developers a, and... What, what would be a good idea? For that space? Yes. That's, that's a good question there, and I thought a little bit about that as a matter of fact. For that space, probably some kind of a park would be a good thing for the community right there. It will not bring $750,000 to the person who owns that, that uh, golf course. I understand that. There aren't many good places, uses for that in my mind. Uh, I wouldn't build a house there, but it's, it is zoned for houses right now. I think it needs to continue in that, that basis there. So you wouldn't object if the owner built a house or a series of houses on that site, is that correct? Yeah. And by and that I, I, I mean single family dwellings. That's right. That's the way it's zoned now. And we bought the property in here and everybody in the Teradon community, that's the way it was set up to be. Why, but that, would that still upset you because you're so close to that side or is there a problem with that? If, if uh, the owner built a single family series of homes up in that area? No, I, you know, that's far enough away. They would, they would actually help me because it'll cut down the road noise that I hear a quarter mile away. I hear that's, that every day. Isn't that a lot closer than the property that's currently on appeal uh, in the Teradyne site? I don't know what you're saying. The lawsuit that's currently on appeal, it's up in the property closer to my house than, than yours? I don't know anything about an appeal. Well, I believe that there is an appeal pending. It, are, isn't that correct? That's correct. Uh, we do have a, a zoning matter that is, is before the Court of Appeals. I, I do want to uh, caution everybody uh, as we go through the public hearing tonight. I, I certainly don't want uh, council members to be considering zoning matters or interpret this as, as being any zoning matters. I, I, I do want to point out that this property <laughs> the project faces a number of approvals and obstacles and, and uh, the, uh, the tax abatement resolution we prepared said that all necessary approvals and normally pro normal procedures will have to be followed in that regard. So I just, I just want to caution the council. I, I don't want you making any decisions about zoning tonight and I don't want anybody to interpret this as a zoning uh, matter. Uh because that, that whole process to answer your question. Uh, no, I'm, I'm inquiring of Mr. Gillespie about his personal preference with regard to the development. And my understanding is you really wouldn't mind single family housing built up there, even though you personally wouldn't do that right. for the well-being of it's true. whatever your personal issues are. I don't have any idea. I, that's all that I have. Thank you. I want to thank uh, everybody for allowing me to speak, and I'm impressed so many people know my name. I'm not trying to be well known, but thank you. Who's next? Yes, ma'am. I know you're filling out the cards too, but if you'd state your name and address for the record. My name is Megan Keis, and I live at 903 Teradine Circle. And I will try to keep this as short as possible. Unfortunately, I do have a few things to say. Um, as you know, IRBs are a tool for governing agencies to provide financing to private business. A tool intended to create new jobs within a market or rejuvenate an industry or business to allow them to maintain a presence in the area, which in turn helps a community keep its tax base stable. The item before you today is a residential, is for the residential development of a multi-tenant three-story apartment building. The proposed location for the apartment is land currently owned and operated by Teradyne Golf Club. The site is currently zoned for single-family residential, which is consistent with the development of the land on the course. And to speak to Mr. Nelson, what you just addressed, um, I would like to note when this was zoned from golf course to the three, to the single-family 30 lots. There was no opposition at that council zoning meeting. 
this, well, there are some patio homes in the immediate area that are struggling to sell. I have to ask you, why would another 125 units to the market suddenly cause the market to improve? If the Highlands townhome units adjacent to this parcel with high-end finishes, low maintenance, and private enclosed parking <coughs> are selling much slower than predicted, how could this proposed product be viable? In the financial implications of your recommended action, you are told of the financial hardship of Teradon Country Club with interest and penalties that are due to late property taxes over the last eight to nine years. It's been stated that this land has been for sale for some time. The sale price agreed upon by Sunflower Development is $750,000 for the 6.7 acres. That comes out to $112,000 an acre. Recently, Andover School District gave intent to purchase the land directly across the turnpike within the same zoning notification area for $25,400 an acre. Which is $400,000 more dollars than that was asked for last year. They have a spectacular realtor. I don't mean to stop right. you short. Do you, you're giving us a history lesson here. We, we all know the facts surrounding this case. Do you have an opinion or a statement you'd like to make regarding the IRB that we're considering tonight? I do. Can, I, can you when get to intent, it? I can, yes, sir. Thank you. When intent to issue the IRBs was initially given, many false and misleading statements were made, which I think makes the city not liable to uphold the intent to issue the bonds. Such as? In November 14th City Council meeting, Mr. Floodman spoke to the knowledgeability of architecture firm ACI Boland, who was working on the elevations and plans for the proposed apartment building. Mr. Floodman stated, ACI Boland has done many types of these developments. Contradictory to the statement he makes six months later of this is untested. The development team seems to be speaking from both sides. Mr. Floodman goes on to give his own professional opinion when prompted by Council Councilman Nelson for a study or Mr. Floodman's opinion if the proposed development has any impact on the real Teradyne residents, as an example. Mr. Floodman responded, and I quote, I can pull studies, but everything I've seen, as long as you go luxury and high end, the correlation is not negative to home values. Now, if you take it down a notch and not have a nice multifamily project, then it absolutely will, end quote. Has he provided those studies? Speaking to the terms of taking it down a notch, when you dive into the market study they provided, you'll realize how the numbers of the proposed luxury living compare to other facilities in Wichita. It's very easy to get wrapped up in the verbiage of high-end and luxury living. The fact of the matter is, according to the market study the applicant had done, the proposed price per square foot is the lowest of comparable rental buildings. This is an adjusted number. Taking, out, taking into account meal plans and other services offered. This seems to be misleading information from the statement he made that the market study came back extremely positive. There also is a club membership included, which is gonna take it down another notch. Okay, you're speaking to the viability of the project, right? I am. Okay. And how... So you don't believe it's going to be a viable project? I don't. Okay. I'm trying to give you information to base that. Isn't that what the purpose of this public hearing is? It is. Okay. Much mention and comparison has been made of the Liberty at Shoal Creek by the developer. The facility, however, is not located on the Country Club Golf Course, as we've stated tonight. It's located on a four-lane divided highway, much like Kellogg, where the Comprehensive Plan of Andover designates such buildings for our city. I have much concern over the bit of false information given at November 14th meeting. Council was asking questions to make an informed decision on intent to issue IREs. Caroline Hale asked Mr. Floodman, in the Liberty Project, what kind of vacancy or occupancy ratio do you keep going? Mr. Floodman responded, that is a partnership project with Keystone Management that is 183 units and it's already on a wait list. 
I called December 18th to verify this, and of the 185 units, only 119 at the, t at the time were occupied, 64% occupancy, and there is no wait list. In addition to there not being a wait list, they're giving rental incentives all coming out of the luxury bottom line or taking it down a notch. If the rental incentives are needed for the proposed apartments, does the developer take the loss or the country club lose out on the already reduced social membership rates? Both would lose. If the Kansas City market can only occupy 64% of their facility with a more urban, larger potential resident pool to draw from, what happens to the facility here in Andover when it's not successful? The owner may at any time sell the building to whomever, whomever they choose. An NER4 facility may begin operation. The luxury living stamp goes out the window if it hadn't already. By the developer's own admission, this building would do little to increase property values, but it absolutely will have a negative effect on Teradyne home values if it's taken down a notch. If the market needed this type of property, then a bank would lend on it. That's not the case here. The developer needs the city to make the steel work. How good is that for the city of Andover? The fact IRBs and 100% property and sales tax abatement are needed for this developer to construct the building is a big, huge red flag. If you do your own research as I have, you'll find there is no reason to issue IRBs. One local bank president told me the 55 plus target market means nothing, even if written in bond or as a zoning restriction. They could run a zoo out of the facility, I'm quoting, from the bank president. They could run a zoo out of the facility and the liquid asset value would be an apartment building. Senior housing is one of the hottest development trends today and there's an oversupply of bank financing available for experienced operators with equity money to invest. Other markets don't use IRB financing to make these types of properties work. Active adult patio homes are the hard, hottest <laughs> housing market out there. Look at Epcon communities in Wichita as one example, Act, in, indicating a lot of competition as well as available financing. There are no less than three other rental projects slated for the East 21st Street corridor, one of which is a three-story building. Those aren't IRBs. Wichita won't issue IRBs for multifamily living except for low-income, nonprofit owners like Presbyterian Manor. Andover should save their IRB bonding capacity and good name for projects in need of them and for projects to serve someone other than a luxury renter. IRBs and luxury should never go hand in hand. In short, no developer should utilize our tax dollars for an untested facility. Recently, the Andover um, residents showed their willingness to pay their share of taxes by voting yes on the school bond issue which passed by an overwhelming 75%. We should expect out-of-state developers to be willing to pay their fair share, fair share of taxes as well. There's more than enough bank financing for qualified, experienced <coughs> developers. Given the many misconceptions from Sunflower Development, the overwhelming opposition of the Territine neighborhood, the fact if IRBs are not obtained, the developer will back out, and the questionable viability of this facility, and the fact few new jobs will be generated from abatement on $25 million. I would ask each council member to vote no to the IRB request. Think of it as betting on the future. It's not fair to invest our tax dollars on an unsure bet. I also feel it's unfair of the city to take a large gamble on the property values of Teradyne residents, tax-paying citizens. The developer has little to lose, and Andover will be stuck with apartments on the only country club golf course forever. This facility will have an impact on all Andover residents. Andover should be cautious not to erode the value of its only country club by parking unproven apartments around arguably the nicest looking building and brand in town at taxpayer expense. Remember, industrial revenue bonds are defined by the state of Kansas to promote, stimulate, and develop the general welfare and economic prosperity of the state of Kansas. The cost-benefit analysis shows a negative impact to the county, schools, and community college. The project before you is not stimulating the economy or creating economic prosperity. It's robbing Peter to pay Paul. Thank you for your time.
He readdressed counsel. Good job on all your research. Okay, who's next? Go right ahead. Hello, my name is Joanne Barkley. I live at 1117 Teradyne Court. My husband and I have raised five children there. We've lived there almost 25 years. We've had children graduate from the Andover Public Schools. We've also been 25 year members of the Teradyne Golf Club, golf members. So it's been a long time and we want nothing more than Teradyne Golf Course to be successful. Um, we love our home, we intend to stay there. I think some of the things that were said tonight, including what Mr. Klaus said about 7.30 is, it all depends on what you want or don't want in your community. We have a community. We have a close-knit community. We're supportive of each other. It's everything we could want. And greater than 85% of us do not want this. We've expressed it. Mr. Detter talked about passion. We have a lot of passion for not wanting it. Thank you. Anybody else? My name is Cindy Ball, and I reside with my husband, Mike, at 908 West Teradyne Circle here in Andover. <clears throat> we have lived in Andover for 33 years. We have owned and operated Ball Heating and Air Conditioning in Andover for over 30 years. I have served on the City Council and the Butler County Commission. I am a graduate of Leadership Butler of Leadership Kansas, which is sponsored by the Kansas Chamber of Commerce. I was a founding member of Promote Andover, Inc and the Andover Police and Fire Foundation. <clears throat> I have served on committees for Butler County Community College, USD 385, and many other local organizations. I am a supporter of Andover, Butler County, and its communities. I share this with you only to emphasize that economic development of this community is something I have worked hard for during the, my time as a resident here. I do not take it lightly when I say I am opposed to the issuance of IRBs and abatement of property taxes to fund an exclusive, upscale, high-end, luxury country, apartment, country club apartment building. These are all adjectives used by Mr. Banks of Sunflower Development Group to describe the proposed project. As has been mentioned, the state statutes say that IRB should be interest issued to the benefit of the whole community. It seems to me that the issuance of IRBs for the apartments proposed is not in keeping with the intent of the statutes to benefit the whole community. Mr. Banks has stated in the zoning hearing that this project would have three to five employees. He's later this evening added that that will now be eight. And that the investment in this project would be around 25 million. The Sunstone Apartments are on, a, on approximately 500,000 square feet of property. There's 205 apartments. And the assessed value of those apartments and that land is $16 million, just over. Their proposed project would be built on 260,000 square feet of land, have 120 apartments, and it's said that the value will be 25 million. I'm not sure the, the numbers add up. I was surprised and disappointed to read in the recommended action document submitted to the mayor and council that the city staff believes that this project is in the spirit and intent of the comprehensive plan, particularly as it relates to senior housing and multifamily. 
It is true that the comprehensive plan acknowledges the need for housing diversity, but it specifically states, and I quote, measures are recommended to reverse this trend and provide more housing diversity and affordability. The testimony and documents presented by Mr. Banks on behalf of Sunflower Development Group have made it clear that contrary to what our comprehensive plans says that the, excuse me, that contrary to what our comprehensive plan says is needed in the community, these apartments will be for a very select group of individuals. Their focus is on only the wealthy that can afford upscale apartments worthy of a country club life. The comprehensive plan states, it has been noted that there is a lack of workforce housing. School teachers, city employees, retail and service business workers, and other people who work in Andover are not able to live in the community in which they work because housing prices are too high. It goes on to say that 61% of Andover units paying rent pay $750 or above each month, and 27% of renters pay between $1,000 and $1,499 a month. What this community needs, according to our comprehensive plan, is affordable housing, not luxury housing. The rents in the proposed facility are projected according to their market study to start at $1,500 a month for a one-bedroom, one-bath apartment. It has been stated by Mr. Banks of Sunflower Development that tenants will be required to be a member of Teradyne Country Club, thus increasing the amount of wealth a person must possess to occupy one of the apartments. It has been discussed, and I will not go over it in total detail, the comprehensive plan is very specific about where this multifamily housing should be located. It refers to the comprehensive plan continuing the US 54400 corridor study, stating that between 1,340 and 3,300 new multifamily dwellings should be constructed in that area over the next five decades. It continues that the two additional locations for multifamily housing should be the Medical Village node along 21st Street and the retail node at Andover Road and Central. The proposed location of this project is not in compliance with the comprehensive plan. It is proposed to be located on a parcel to be created which will be landlocked and not accessible from a public street. In the recommended action document provided by the city staff to the mayor and council, it is stated the Sunflower Development Group has made it very clear that debt service coverage cannot be achieved without tax exemption during the first 10 years of this product, project's existence. Sunflower Development Group submitted operating projections to the council at their request for IRVs on November 14th this year, last year, that show with the exception of year two, not only will debt service be achievable, but in fact, they are showing distributable cash flow from operations after debt service beginning in year three. The operating projections submitted by Sunflower Development Group show with the exception of the first year substantial net operating profits even after paying their share of property taxes. Almost three quarters of a million dollars in year two and in excess of, excess of 1.25 million after that. <coughs> Abatement of property taxes will not make this development profitable. It will add even more profits to the pockets of the investors by taking it out of the pockets of the citizens of Andover. The profits that are made here will not be spent here, but rather wherever the investors of this Kansas City-based developer live. The extra property tax that each individual in Andover must pay in order to abate the property tax for the developer is money that will not be spent in Andover. But perhaps a Sunflower Development Group is concerned that their operating projections are too optimistic. They have projected only a 5% vacancy rate. Sunstone Apartments in Andover currently experiences an average of 10% vacancy rate. And the sister project of Sunflower Development Group in Kansas City that they frequently refer to, Shoal Creek at Liberty, reported a 36% vacancy rate as of December 2017. A similar vacancy rate for this project would reduce projected income by at least $806,722 annually. 
In fact, a vacancy rate of just over 16 percent would be enough to prohibit debt coverage service even with requested tax exemption. Failure of this project would not only negatively affect the entire neighborhood of Teradyne, but all of Andover and its ability to issue future bonds. If this council were to vote to approve the issuance of IRBs and the abatement of property taxes for the development, each taxpayer will have to pay more than they otherwise would in property taxes. You will be asking your neighbors, seniors on fixed incomes, young families just starting out, and every business owner and resident of Andover to pay more than their share so that the developer can make more money for their investors who want to provide country club living for wealthy individuals. The taxpayers of Andover have on several occasions shown by a strong majority that they are opposed to increased property taxes by their votes to increase sales taxes to pay for city projects. More than 80 percent of the homeowners in Teradyne are opposed to this project. Further, the vote, of the, the vote on the issuance of IRBs seems out of order in this case given that the zoning for the project is still to be heard by the Planning Commission. A vote of approval by this body to issue IRBs may seem to some, myself included, oops, a vote to approve the IRBs may seem to some printed it out too many times, I've got it messed up. My point being that by voting to approve the IRBs this evening, it may seem that you are in fact approving the zoning as well, and thereby circumventing the actual hearing on the zoning. As your staff has pointed out in their recommended action, overwhelming opposition from a neighborhood or from the city at large can be the sole reason for turning down the tax exemption. Please vote against the issuance of the IRBs and the tax abatement for this upscale high-end apartment building. Questions, comments? Is there anyone else that would like to speak? Yes, sir. My name is Austin Graves. I live at 566 Parallel Drive here in Andover. Uh, getting new into this process and everything, so I'm becoming informed. Um, I understand there are several steps that have to take place for this to actually become a reality. Yes. Uh, first is the IRB, then the zoning. Uh, it's not. The IRB application is contingent upon successful rezoning, okay. platting, and site plan approval. Makes sense. Uh, one of the questions I have is uh, the IRB is contingent upon 55 or older, 80% of the tenants or 80% of the units. I believe that was explained that 80% of the units. That's 80%. the way my, I understood it. But I don't know how it's written in the IRB. We said 80% of the tenants in your presentation um, and Mr. Floodman said as long as one person and a couple was over. So let's just say let's just say one person in each. But I don't unit. know how it's written in our in, in specific language. Understood. So let's just say one person in each unit is, meets the 55 or older criteria. Is that is that count as 80? Is the IRB going to be 80 percent of the units having at least one person 55 or older, or is it going to be 80 percent of the units that are leased being 55 or older that's I understand, understand what you're saying I'll, uh, I'll, I'll get a clarification on that okay but. Um, and the mm -hmm. next question I would have is how how is the city going to authenticate and basically audit or govern this and make sure that this is actually being done through the 10 years of the IRB that's, that's just a question I have, is how do we verify the information that the criteria of the IRB, if it, does, if it is passed, 
How are we verifying that that is actually being met? That's a question. I, I planned on working with my bond council to get, they, <laughs> they have counsel, and I think we can get to them and uh, supervise uh, those details. I, I think it would be included in the lease agreement yeah. to have a periodic audit. But well, he's wanting to know how I'm going to verify or oh. whoever. I'm going to work with our city attorney and bond council to work with Mr. Floodman's council to get that necessary data. Okay, I just I'm I'm kind of concerned about there being any privacy or fair housing market or fair housing information that can't be shared. You know, if someone doesn't put their age on their application, are they going to be denied uh, access to the facility? Just questions of that nature. I'm just wondering how we're going to govern that and how we're going to make sure that this is being met if we pass this. So, did we find an answer to the specific questions? Is it units or? percentage of all tenants uh, I know that uh, mr. floodman said that he would require that at least one of the residents in a unit be uh, 55 the way we prepared the tax abatement resolution on the recommendation of staff is that uh, within two years of the project certificate of occupancy the tenant will certify to the city that 80 percent of all residents of the project or 55 years so so the way the resolution is written to answer the specific question is is that it would require that 80 percent of the residents be over age 55 in okay. order to continue the abatement <laughs> I think that was a very good question um, I, I will tell you that you know obviously at these preliminary stages we haven't put significant thought into how we would uh, audit the uh, occupancy except that it would it would start at the two-year mark uh, I, I will tell you that uh, federal law prohibits uh, discrimination in housing uh, other than uh, obviously if you have senior facilities that are uh, limited to uh, persons of an older age uh, if if we said you you had to be under 21 we, we couldn't do that but 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 uh, this is this is typically an allowable restriction, and I would anticipate uh, that we would use a formula or compliance certificate in the lease, uh, much like they do for. Uh, uh, and I hesitate to say this, but but much as they do for low income housing, in that annually, uh, you have to certify how many residents you have in the facility and what their ages are and what the percentage is and that uh, that certificate is made under oath uh, w would be what I anticipated but obviously I haven't uh, spent any time writing that lease but that that's that's what I anticipated uh, the city could require quarterly compliance I I guess uh, it, it's basically a detail that hasn't been decided so, or discussed so one of the question yes thank you very much so one of the recommendations I would make for the for the group today and is uh, I understand that you know moving forward there's going to be a vote today if everything if everybody agrees to go to forward with a vote my recommendation for the panel would be is make sure that we understand a how we're going to govern and over have an oversight into the conditions of the IRB being met and include that into the discussion the the description today that you're going to vote on and also make sure that we have clarity on how the tenant language is going to be is it units tenants let's let's make sure we get that correct and right because what we don't want to have happen is is if this goes forward I'm not for it okay but if this does go forward Make sure we have clarity and that the uh, city council members that are on the seat as this goes through over the next 10 years, they are given the tools to be successful with this IRB. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak? Yes, ma'am. Hello. Uh, my name is Justine Milmine. I live at 846 Bramerton. I have lived in Andover for eight years. Um, I want to start by saying we have a room full of highly intelligent people here who have obviously done their due diligence. And I would just respectfully ask that you consider all of this due diligence, this important information that has been given by these people. Um, I think it's important to know that we're not against this because of shallow reasons, like we just don't want an apartment building or it spoils our view. 
My biggest problem is the IRB and the fact that this could be used somewhere else to stimulate job growth in Andover, um, to create a better economic environment and not provide luxury apartments. Um, and I think that's an important thing for us to consider at this meeting rather than personal feelings. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Eric Wigton. I live at 264 South Lakeside Drive, Andover. And I'm against this, but probably for more financial reasons. For the city, it sounds like we don't get any assurances for the uh, 55 and over for two years, which is the largest impact of the abatement is those first two years, correct? That's correct. So the longer it goes on, the less incentive they have to keep it 55 and over, and they could just turn it into anything else. The only thing that keeps them from having that is the abatement, which goes down over time. And then with the part of what you're saying, the um, fair housing violation, I've done a lot of landlord work and worked in apartments. And unless it is designated senior housing, you could not say that you cannot have you know, children in the household. That's a fair housing violation of family status. So you could not do that, and I don't know how you would audit it unless you called it senior housing, which is going to be its own minefield. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Good evening. Thank you. I'm, my name is Gail Mayfield. I live at 912 West Teradyne Circle, and I will make this quite brief or as brief as I can. Um, First of all, I, I do understand the whole com their, their concept of what they are trying to do. I am opposed to it um, for various reasons. Tonight, my biggest concern is the IRBs. What my main question you, to you would be, if you approve this IRB for a luxury apartment complex at this time, are you going to set a precedent for down the road for other developers to come into Andover and with we want um, luxury this and luxury that and using up your IRB fundings when you're not bringing in industries that are bringing in more jobs. Anybody the got an answer? answer to that? Yeah, I, I, yeah I've got an answer. Uh, the answer to that is your first part of your question is no, it doesn't set a precedence. We take each and every one of these cases on its own merits. For instance, the Holiday Inn Express, when it was built in Andover, um, was granted IRBs. The Days Inn Express across the street was not. Okay, um, each one of these, uh, each one of these, are considered individually. Um, there is no requirement for us to grant anybody an IRB for any particular reason. Um, the second part of your question is, there's not like a limited number of funds for industrial revenue bonds, okay? Yeah, I, I know, th I am aware of that. I kind of misspoke when I said that. As soon as okay. I said it, I knew that. But. Well, and, and they're not an obligation of the city of Andover. Somebody has to buy those bonds, though. Absolutely, and in this case, in this Who's case. Who's gonna buy those bonds? In this case, they've already placed them with the bank. Okay. If if this that were to pass, that was my next question. Actually, right. <laughs> right, yeah, and and that's one of the questions that we ask going into it. Are these bonds already placed? Do you have a do you have a lender that's willing to buy them? And ninety nine percent of the time, the answer is yes. So when we're talking about industrial revenue bonds, we're not talking borrowing money from the city. They're borrowing money from their bank, utilizing a tool that lets them abate, lets us abate property taxes as an incentive for them to build in our community. And the reason why we do this, I've heard a lot of comments this evening about, um, you know, let's, why are we using these tax incentives to build luxury apartments, you know? And typically, we haven't done a lot of housing 
uh, units in the past, but we're finding ourselves in direct competition. As our um, city uh, manager tells us, we're in direct competition with the city of Wichita. Yeah, there are a bunch of new projects in Wichita, housing uh, apartments that don't get tax abatements because they don't need them to be viable in Wichita. They need them, we need, they need them to be viable in Andover because of the humongous difference in the tax rates. We're, we're 40 mils higher and we, we can't control that. I mean, that's, that's the reason why we would that's, even remotely <laughs> consider it for That's housing. called location. There's not, you know, I'm, right. a, I'm a real estate broker. That's called location. You can't, you can't I think, move Andover, so. I think, you know, I think Andover's worth the tax difference. It, I do. Yeah. I think right across 159th Street, I think Andover's worth the tax difference. But if we're going to continue to attract projects that benefit this city, that add tax valuation to the city, to add to the tax base is what we're talking about here. Sometimes you got to give them a little incentive to get them here. Okay, I got just two more things, sure. and, and one of them you guys probably have already answered, but I do want you to think about it. The comprehensive plan talks about specifically multiple, multiple family homes and within certain areas, certain core, and major, major streets. That's not the word you used. You said 159th is. Okay, we can all probably agree with that. We know it's going to be widened. We can all agree with that. But this property is not going to connect directly with 159th Street. It's going to be using a private drive. How does that how does that work in with what your comprehensive comprehensive plan says? Okay, that is actually going to be a platting issue. I will tell you that there is a multi-million dollar renovation that's going to happen to 159th Street here including the new bridge over KTA Turnpike. But that's not really the subject matter that we need to focus on tonight. That stuff will work itself out. No, I but, understand that. Yeah, but it's still, I mean, this it's been brought up multiple times tonight about the comprehensive plan and the location of multiple families. Let, let's housing, talk about the comprehensive so, plan, okay? So that's, you know. That is not... Let me it's say what so it's a plan. Well, let me okay? say one, one more it's thing. It's not I'll set, set down in stone. We don't have to do that. It is just a, the best suggestion that we have creating trying to create a plan but that doesn't mean we have to follow it it's a it's a suggestion okay uh, one more thing and then i will sit down i am of that 55 and older i will be looking for downsizing and luxury nice place to live right now i live in teradyne right now i'm opposed to this because i do believe that it is going to have a negative effect on the property values within Teradyne Estates and Teradyne Two. That is also going to affect your tax base and Butler County's tax base when those assessed values go down. I believe you need to keep that in mind when you look at the R I R voting on the IRBs. Anyone else like to speak? Yes, sir. My name is Chris Dudley. I live at 1124 Teradyne Drive. Um, I could not, I mean, I didn't have anything prepared. I could not do any of the research that these guys have done. They have done a phenomenal job on that. You don't need to hear all that again. So I will keep it a little personal, even though. Ms. Milmine said, you know, this isn't all personal. It is going to destroy my view. I mean, that's my first point of opposition. That's a little tiny point. That picture that Mr. Floodman has of that apartment complex is taken from my bedroom window. Okay. And so that's one reason I don't, I'm opposed to it. It's a small reason. The, the bigger reasons are I agree with what some other people have said, that uh, the industrial part of the industrial revenue bonds is, is, is questionable on this, and very questionable, and I think it's still going to have a negative impact um, the point that was just made about it the 159th being a grid line and the comprehensive plan just a plan just an idea just a suggestion but those were I'm assuming educated people that suggested that and they had an idea of where the multifamily home should be and my backyard is not one of those ones that they listed um, it even if you call 159th the grid line and it's going to have an entry and you know the plotting will be done and it'll be widened out 
you are still putting an apartment complex into a neighborhood. And whether you think that's a neighborhood or not, Teradyne as a golf course with the homes around it is a neighborhood, and that is going into that neighborhood, whether it has a private drive or separate drive. So it does affect the people. So I would plead with everybody to, to think about the people more than the numbers a little bit on this one. Um, I, I just don't think it's going to have a good impact for the area of Teradyne, which I live in, or the area, or the community of Andover in general. Thanks. Anyone else? Good, after Good evening. I'm Shirley Anderson. I live at 812 Bremerton. And I do agree with Mr. Banks. I also wish I was not here and I was at home, but unfortunately we're all here tonight. And I would ask everyone just to keep an open mind and just gather the information and the research that people have gathered and just listen to the facts. Um, when I heard about the um, industrial revenue bond exemption, I did some research. I went to the Kansas tax revenue website. And what it said is that, yes, the city can vote on it. But the qualifications are, it has to be for purchase, construction, improvement, or remodeling of commerce, uh, commercial, hospital, industrial, natural resources, recreational development, or manufacturing purposes. And I do not think sunflower development fits any of these. Um, if commercial, they're not a commerce, they're not buying or selling merchandise, they're not industrial, they're not doing industry manufacturing, and they're definitely not recreational development, which is some kind of physical activity that's for a community. So based on these, I don't think they fit these qualifications. And then it also states that if it were, if the city council were to approve it, um, the package goes to the county appraiser with comments from other people. And then once the whole package then goes to the Kansas um, board of tax appeals. So if it is approved, I would want people to provide comments to the county appraiser about all the facts and all the things that we've discussed tonight. And then the second thing I also want to share about is um, under the Kansas board, Kansas rules of ethics, an attorney under rule 226, rule 1.8F, an attorney should not represent someone if there's an interference with their professional judgment. And that's the Kansas rule of ethics was approved by the Kansas City Supreme Court. Um, my next um, item I would like to share are three reasons. Is one, there's going to be more traffic with the new school at the corner of 13th and 159th. And right now, for the use of this IRB, will not help fuel the economic development of Andover. And three, um, asking taxpayers to pay for something that that's not what they intend their money to go to. And um, Teradon Country Club was not successful as a hotel, is why it's now a golf course with businesses. So as a resort development, it just didn't work. And so in my conclusion, I would like for you guys to, um, I'm asking you to find that the IRB, think about whether it's legally and factually qualify as an IRB under the Kansas um, Department of Revenue. This was today, I just went on the website, and I also went on the website for Kansas Commerce, and they also list the same qualifications, and then also the IRS, what it exempts money for. And I appreciate your time. Thank you. JT, would you like to opine on the um, exception in this case? Which classification the apartment complex falls under to make it qualifiable to, for consideration of IRBs? <clears throat> well, I have a couple of thoughts actually on that topic. Um, she's referring to KSA uh, 121740 which would be the anticipated uh, statute. And uh, we have uh, uh, considered these uh, rental projects as commercial facilities before, uh, and uh, those have been approved by the Kansas Board of Tax Appeals. Uh, I want the applicant to know that 
uh, I, mean, I mean, that's their risk. We'll 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 approve it as a as a city, but their <clears throat> risk and costs associated with submitting the application, getting the county's comments, and going before the Kansas Board of Tax Appeals is a cost they have. Also, so that there's no confusion, uh, I represent the city, the city, and only the city. So if uh, if there's any confusion about whose side I'm on, whatever uh, decisions you make, that's the side I'm on. So uh, I think I've, I've made that incredibly clear in the past. Uh, the city policy uh, does require, if you do an industrial revenue bond, that the costs associated with that negotiation and bond council are paid by the developer. Uh, so I didn't, I didn't want anybody to think I was being cutesy about that. That doesn't mean I'm representing the developer. I'm, I'm not, and I'm, I'm uh, not on city staff. I am intending only to do uh, your bidding and what you instruct me to do. While we're uh, on some of these topics, and I know we have to continue with the public hearing, and, and there may be other useful comments, and I've found a lot of the comments and criticisms uh, to be both uh, appropriate and, and, and necessary considerations. Um, I, I did think I would go ahead and address, just to back up the uh, previous statement, uh, you're, not, you're not spending any uh, issuing authority here. There, there is no statutory uh, limit on industrial revenue bonds. Uh, the, other, uh, the other thing I would say is that I think probably the Kansas Home Rule Authority uh, to some extent would allow us, if, if necessary, to uh, issue these bonds under home rule, although that will probably... Uh, call into question uh, the abatement. I did not understand that you were intending to set a precedent. And the other important thing I noticed that was a comment made was that uh, they could sell this at any time and end the uh, 55 requirement. And, and I think as currently established, that statement was correct. Uh, so so I, think, I think the, the uh, indication we received from staff was that we would bind them as long as they were receiving any benefit or incentive um, by um, by agreement and by negotiation I do want to point out that the tax abatement resolution indicating your intent is still subject to the negotiation of all IRB and lease documents and I'd like to think we're pretty good at that uh, and there are going to be other things that are going to come up that the city may want to consider or have included. Um, theoretically, no one has suggested this, but you, you could uh, require a, a covenant for a longer period of time on the use of land. Uh, I, I don't know that the developer would consider that, but, but you, could. you could. You could place in place a land use restriction agreement uh, to prevent the the notion of them just selling it after year three and ending all the incentives and and uh, turning it into uh, anybody uh, can live there type place. Uh, the other comment uh, from a gentleman about not uh, discriminating against families. I, I think he's right about that. I don't. I don't think we can. I think we can require the residency be senior housing, but there's a certain number of rules that will nonetheless have to be followed uh, if they do that under the Fair Housing Act. Uh, I also uh, wasn't trying to be cute about not knowing what my bond council fee was. I, I, I want you all to know that. I, I really haven't given it a great deal of thought, uh, but it is material. Uh, when, when bonds are issued, that's a significant amount of work for my law firm, and, and it is a material number. It is not an immaterial number. So I don't want anybody to think that I'm making any specific suggestions or trying to lead you one way or the other. I'm just trying to answer the legal questions. And then lastly, so far on the cost-benefit analysis, uh, the comments that uh, I noted were that the state's benefit uh, seems unreasonable, and I believe that that is attributable to the uh, lack of an import factor on that, as, as I indicated earlier. Uh, and and I, I, I don't know that the model analyzes that. Um, 
it, it is also true that if you would change the inputs or change the variables, it would come out differently. That is, in, in fact, the case. So if, if you have any other questions of me, that's just the notes I've made so far of, of questions you might have, and, and I think you need to continue the public hearing. I just, I just want to be helpful and answer your questions. Would anyone else like to speak? We step up to the podium. In regards to what Mr. Klaus just addressed, um, if the facility is not viable and it does go bankrupt or is not viable at 55 plus and Andover's left with a big empty building, what happens then? The 55 plus, I'm assuming, gets lifted and it's sold and just regular apartments? Anything? Well, the answer uh, to the question depends on whether or not the bonds are still outstanding. The covenants as currently proposed would require that so long as the bonds are outstanding, meaning the debt is retired uh, through the city's industrial revenue bond process, the uh, covenants on use would stay in place. So they'd have to completely end all incentives and, and quite frankly, pay it off in order to uh, do that. Uh, to answer the question about valuation, I should have said this earlier, but I, I guess I made some assumptions. Uh, I, I am not a financial advisor or economic development uh, economist, uh, and so I, I'm, I'm an attorney and, and bond lawyer. But to specifically answer the question, if the incentives were ended and they were paid off, unless we were to insert additional limitations into the project, that would end the requirements that have been proposed by city staff. It's not to say we couldn't have those as part of the uh, requirements for the issuance of the bonds, and I don't want anybody to think that we're ultimately uh, agreeing to all the terms of the issuance of the bonds uh, tonight. That would be step three. Uh, tonight's decision is whether or not uh, the issuance of the bonds, if they can be agreed upon, will result in uh, this particular benefit as it relates to property tax exemption. And I, I think that decision is yours and entirely up to you. So even with the continuance of 55 plus written in, if they default on bonds, the 55 plus stays with the next owner of the facility? It could. It, could. It, it, it conceivably could. I will tell you that even uh, in the senior to low income housing um, requirements where a land use restriction <coughs> agreement is used, you can typically get out of the federal government's requirements if there's just a total uh, foreclosure sale and, and bankruptcy. And uh, this is because I believe the federal government has determined that uh, making land unusable is just not a good idea. So uh, as long as it's operating, uh, the requirements would remain in place. But to just be completely fair about the comment, I can foresee circumstances that would result in a judicial determination that the limitations placed on the land, even if we went to a land use restriction agreement, uh, need to be removed in order to make the land uh, usable. Uh, here, I think the developer is more than happy to agree to these requirements, but um, it, I, don't, I don't want to ever promise that uh, bonds create something permanent because they can be retired, they can be paid off. Um, and, and that would be true, quite frankly, whether they got bonds or not. And there are circumstances, particularly in bankruptcy, where agreements, particularly the covenants and lease agreements, can be set aside by the court in order to make sure that the investors and the lenders uh, can be made whole or mo more whole than they would otherwise be. Uh, in fact, we exempt from our opinion uh, the results of what would happen in connection with the bankruptcy on the bonds. Anyone else like to speak? Okay, I will close the public hearing and move discussion up to the bench. Comments, council? 
Yeah, Mr. Mayor. Court. Um, I guess I have a couple questions in regarding to what we're, we're voting on specifically tonight and things to think about when making the decision on um, issuing the bonds and if some of the thoughts could even be or should even be um, considered for that specific thing that we're voting on tonight. Um, I guess I should turn my microphone on. That would be very helpful because everybody's like <laughs> staring at me. Like, okay. Should I start over? No. Okay. So a um, few things. Uh, one is this is probably one of the most difficult um, things that I've has come across uh, since I've been on the council. And um, there's a, a lot going on. Uh, there's a lot of moving parts. Um, I think that uh, not, not to diminish anything, but certainly with the developer, everything's framed that everything's rosy. And with everyone that's opposed, everything's terrible. And when you go into doing your research, which, by the way, I think is amazing, um, and um, I would hope that all of it's you know, accurate and correct and, and everything, um, I will still say that when you do your research, you are looking for everything that could possibly be wrong, and that's what's presented. And it's this, the opposing view with the developer. That's what they're doing. They're, they're saying, okay, everything that's rosy, here's what could be presented. Um, I do find it <coughs> um, unfortunate that uh, there have been a couple of possible re misrepresentations um, on the current developments um, that, uh, that uh, are underway or have, have been up for a couple of years and percentages of occupancy or how they're doing. Um, and that certainly is one of the big selling points of a project like this is uh, history. Um, and to, <clears throat> to, to have notice or come to realize that some of the numbers and such that are um, presented are probably wrong um, doesn't help when someone's trying to make a decision that's as strong as this, especially when you have such a strong opposing uh, group of people. Um, the uh, second piece um, that I that really hits me is uh, the whole discussion on likelihood of of success, and that's really where I have a question on um, this this vote tonight being really on bonds. Um, would it be appropriate for my um, thinking that it would or would not be a successful project be appropriate to even think about in this specific vote, or would it more be appropriate in one of the other pieces, or is that not even something you can tell me? <clears throat> you know, the, the, the nice thing about this decision-making process is that I think you can base your decision on uh, any reasoning that you desire or no reasoning that you desire. I don't think you could place it on a bad reason, and, and by that I mean uh, something that you either know to be incorrect or would somehow discriminate uh, against a protected class. So uh, whereas in zoning, you sit in a sort of a quasi-judicial function having to exercise your own judgment as it relates to land use and not accept necessarily the judgment of others, I think that this is a legislative uh, decision, and I think that you are free to exercise your authority from your legislative seat on uh, really any valid or, or no reason at all. I, just, I don't think you could base it on a bad reason. So I, I don't think that anything that's been presented tonight is off limits for consideration uh, because you're, you're being asked to do something uh, significant as it relates to an incentive and, and um, while, while this sounds terrible if you didn't like the way the side the developers hair was parted on and you just decided that that made you feel bad that that, that would be uh, not not encouraging that I'm just saying that 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 would be a not I mean that would be a not reason but but nonetheless your your vote could be made Okay, and I guess the last uh, thing I, I want to bring up myself is, is I was part of the Comprehensive Development Plan, I was part of the, the Dillon 2012, and um, certainly as has been pointed out, it's a plan and it's a guideline, it's not a you must build this here. That being said, um, I think it's unfortunate where we're looking at building this thing, because truly it's in the middle of a neighborhood, and it's not necessarily um, where any of the other things that we've looked at, IRBs, the hotels, and the um, other apartment complexes have been. 
Um, not to say that's going to, you know, that's that's just one factor in, in my thoughts tonight when we vote. Um, I, I love business. I'm be honest with you. I, I love seeing new business come to Andover, and I would hate to see um, some people because you know, because they don't want business to show up in Andover to to be opposed to it and uh, and just kind of make up stuff. But I don't really see that here tonight. I really see a community of people that are really trying to fight for you know their view and their their community. And you also, by the way, are fighting for business in Andover and to see what could potentially be an amazing project happen in Andover. So, like I said, it's not, this, this is probably one of the most difficult decisions or whatever that, that I'm going to make. Um, and either way I go, you know, I'm, I'm the bad guy um, from someone, which I, that's why I'm here, right? That's why I was voted to be up here. Um, but I do want to thank everyone that, that spoke tonight. I, I know it's not easy to get up in front and speak. Um, I know it's even harder to find really good information to share. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the framing thing is something that we've all have to understand as we're on the council and we listen is that everybody's framing things the way that they want us to hear it. Um, like, for example, I don't necessarily think that anyone was up here because this is an IRB. I think everyone was up here opposed because they don't want it in their community, regardless of what was said. That's my opinion. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so I just wanted to put that out there and um, let you know. <laughs> Probably it's not just me. I'm sure it's all of us that that are um, going to have to you know, take all this into account and, and make a decision, and it's, and it's not an easy one in either direction. Can I say Thank something? You, Mary. Yeah, sure, sure. You commented about it's unfortunate of the location. I get that. But you got to understand, every single apartment complex that has been built in the city of Andover is as close or closer to single family residences as this proposed one is. Probably closer. There's differences of thousands of feet. I, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, look just, at, I look at what we just did with Sunstone, right? I mean, yeah, right. sure, that's closer, but it's not in what would be considered an encompassed community. That was next to the Dillons. Um, it was in between maybe the Dillons and the Y. You don't think the neighborhood to no, the south of Sunstones is an encompassed community? I, I, uh, yeah, you but think they were opposed to that I project? Think, I, I'm sure they the were. line of trees there is a difference. But it, it would be different if that was built in the middle of the houses or maybe up against the road of where the houses are versus on the other side of a, a natural break that already had commercial. Um, Plan for it. Yeah, and, and I, I, I'm not going to debate you. I, I, I'm just saying, there, yes. It, it, it's, I'm know. just saying every single apartment complex in Andover backs up to single-family residential. There's no exceptions. I, I would I would have to say that I, I think that um, any type of a a, a deal like a um, country club would be different. It would be more of a unique type area than just. Uh, but I don't know if I'm in Crescent Lake, so yeah, I guess if an apartment complex wanted to go in where you know where the dollar store is, I might. I don't know. I, You're I, opposed I don't to know. it. I, <laughs> I'm not going to say that. Um, so yeah. Others? Mr. Mayor, I've got a couple comments here. I, again, I live in the area, not very close to that particular potential facility. I perceive my role as, as uh, one that normally lets the market determine when and where they wish to build within reason and keep City Hall out of your pretty hair to the extent that we reasonably can. And I continue to advocate that. And sometimes you'll continue to be mad at me and sometimes you, you will praise me. Uh, with regard to Teradyne, we have had our ups and downs. And it's not fun when they file bankruptcy and you live through that for three years. It, it, it isn't fun. And uh, it also isn't great for the city of Andover when they can't get the property taxes paid. Pretty ugly situation. And what we don't want to do is to get ourselves in a repeat situation. Uh, you know, we, in the current zoning, it's, it was originally contemplated that that would be 
a reasonably high dollar, I'll call it a single family development, but it was uh, e either a, a townhome type of an arrangement or a condominium type of an arrangement where there was actually a, a fairly closely held single family homes. Uh, and regardless of what others here tonight at Teradyne might think might be a park, I think it, it still would be a, an excellent proposition for the development of that site. Uh, but we're not, we're not there today. Uh, thirdly, I, I would like to myself personally commend Mr. Floodman for being extremely professional, uh, courteous, uh, excellent presenter. He's done his homework, in my opinion, magnificently. There isn't, there is not one project that I've ever been hired as a lawyer or a developer where you can't go back and do a better job somewhere. But I'm just telling you that you did, a, in my opinion, an excellent job, and I commend you for that arrangement. As I say, let the market determine how to develop the property but there needs to be certain assurances. And in that, I, I take into account the type of neighborhood that it's in and the impact on adjacent properties. And there are a number of other areas that get into the issue of zoning that we're not gonna get into tonight, but it's something that always goes through my mind. Uh, an example would be, in, in my opinion again, Teradyne is not Flint Hills National. Uh, and yet there are a lot of uh, quality developments at Teradyne. There are beautiful homes, great amenities, and one of the amenities is a private country club. Uh, and that means a lot to all of those that live around Teradyne. And what you're asking tonight is to bring a public apartment building to a private country club and that's what I think has bothered a lot of people and when I asked you this evening about uh, the uh, Shoal Creek and the, the other projects that you're talking about those weren't actually on golf courses you know can you imagine if if uh, Flint Hills uh, uh, I mean I, I, I suppose but the, the point that I would have, can you imagine if they developed their private golf course by way of a public apartment building? I, I just don't think it'll ever happen. And I, I'm just not sure that that project is fit for Teradyne for the same reasons. Uh, uh, I also have a little bit of concern, and some of these uh, fine men and ladies have uh, raised the issue of, of how you police the 55 range. I'm still not sure what in the world it is, but I, I know that you can manage it. But I look at it from the other point of view, and that is, well, you're entitled to 20% that could be 18 years of old. or. <clears throat> or whatever age, uh, that's approximately 25 units. And, uh, and that's if everything's going well. What I really need to consider is, is not only the beautiful building that you have planned, and I guarantee it's beautiful, it's, it, it's what happens in, in 10 years or so, or 20 years. What I hate to get off this bench and in 20 years, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry I've done what I just did, that it's only 60% full, and it's that 20 at some point in time is going to be 50, could be more, and, and now we really do have a conflict in the mind of the members that they have a private country club with private single-family dwellings and a public apartment building. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry 
about the $25 million investment. We need it in Andover. I would love it in Andover. <clears throat> I'd really like to have it at the Andover Municipal Golf Course area. I think there's some room over there. But in spite of that, uh, I'm afraid that I'm going to have to not support the project in the, in the current status. And uh, there's, there's nothing that I know of that you could have changed. I think you've argued your position extremely well. But overall, I, I'm all in favor of, of uh, private public partnerships. They work in a lot of situations. Uh, but I just don't see it here. And for, for those reasons, I'm going to have to vote no. Others? Well, I suppose it's vote time, right? You, you need to entertain a motion. Well, yeah, that'd be a good idea instead of not making a motion. We've done that too. Council, what's your pleasure? I see no pleasure. You can make a motion not to, not to adopt it if you want, I suppose, right? Or you can make a motion to adopt it and see where the votes fall. But whatever you do, I can't make a motion for you. Mr. Mayor, I'd make a Sorry. motion that we uh, do not adopt the resolution as recommended. I'll second. Okay, we've got a motion by Troy and a second by CR to not adopt the resolution as presented. Further discussion? I'll say one thing. I'll say a couple things, actually. I don't think we are here to talk about an IRB tonight. I think we were here for all the neighbors of and residents of Terradine to express their displeasure at building anything near their neighborhood, anything near that clubhouse, because they like it exactly the way it is. And I'm just going to say, be careful what you're asking for here, because you're not allowing the current owner of Terradine to develop his property to his fullest and highest use. And you're already in one law case over it. There's probably going to be another one here pretty quick. I don't know that to be a fact. To your point, Teradyne has gone through bankruptcy several times. You're not going to bankrupt the current owner, but at some point in the future, it's not going to make good business sense or economic sense to him to keep it open. He could shut that golf course down any time he wants. And I'm telling you, he has partners in it. They're done. They're not putting another dime into it. They do have debt. That debt will be retired. But there's nothing that says he has to keep that golf course open. And that right there is the majority of your house values. So do what you want. Protest against everything that's going on there. That you're right. And I can, I'm not going to say that I wouldn't do the same thing if I lived there even. But be careful what you're asking for here. Because eventually something will happen and it's probably not going to be to your liking further discussion i would like to make one comment <clears throat> um i did not grow up here um i have not lived here for 25 30 years but <clears throat> i have for six years um i have seen developments like this um there's one for instance uh lakewood country club uh, it's owned by Marriott. It's down in uh, Fairhope, Alabama. And um, it's a pretty big developer. Uh, they have a, it's a country club. has two golf courses on it. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they also have a 16-story condo building. Um, they had plans for multiple ones, but they only built one. And that one seems to be full. Um, and it's a complement to that development. So 16-story con condo building versus 
a two or three story apartment complex is similar uh, but owned still by the developer of that golf course uh, which it's still a you know a member's golf course um, so I can see the benefits both ways you know uh, I wish it was more of a condo you, you you're buying the unit uh, versus an apartment uh, now you have a investment from that uh, owner that they're buying a 150 or two hundred thousand dollar condo um, versus versus an apartment I think that's more sustainable um, I'm not sure if y'all you can if there's any changes or any ideas of, of that um, the uh, uh, the view looks great I mean it's uh, it's a good-looking you know picture um, but I wish it was more of a condo development than an apartment. Further discussion? Okay, to be clear, the motion was by Troy, seconded by CR to not approve this, adopt this resolution. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, say aye. I didn't hear six eyes to approve. So let's do this again. Can, can, can I ask for a show of hands after the eyes? I mean, what? Uh, I, hear the law I heard actually, a lot of no votes. The state law actually requires them to vote verbally. I know but, that. But where there's, where there's confusion, I, I, I think you, you can, I mean, the clerk is confused, so. That's right. I am, I am confused, I mean, too, because uh, I heard wait, wait, some eyes. I heard no nays. But I didn't hear if there was at least four eyes. Under the circumstances, it, I think it's completely appropriate to, to ask for a verification of the vote. Let's do this again. So I don't want to classify this as a re-vote. So I want to verify what the vote was. Can I just go individually? Or what are we, what, what's the proper form here? Uh, you can. Ordinances actually require a roll call vote, but this is not an ordinance, so it isn't required, but you can certainly. Why can't we just raise our hands? You can do that. Okay, but that's, I'm, I don't want to necessarily recall the vote. So all those that were in favor, can you please raise your right hand? There you go. Motion uh, carries. To not adopt. All right, let's move on. Mr. Mayor, can we get a break? I'm, yeah. I'm Seriously? Sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> get a bathroom break. Can we get five minutes? Are we gonna yeah, 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 yeah. Five minutes. Sorry. Thanks. Is going to be waiting at my car? <laughs> Such a stud. He's done. He's done. Yeah.
Okay, uh, break time's over. It's tough. How's that? <laughs> Move on to item number 12. Uh, we have an emergency siren electrical relocation. So at Andover Road and Southwest 120th by Flint Hills National, <clears throat> there is a outdoor warning siren. The pole that the outdoor warning siren is on has got to be moved because of the <clears throat> Andover Road extension of the project going from Four Mile Creek past Southwest 120th. It is in the area of the utility relocation. But the rural electric put in a transformer and some pedestals for power. Um, it is our obligation to take it from the power or what is the new electrical meter over to the pole and redo that power supply because this where it's being fed, fed overhead is going to be going away. Um, the work by Butler Rural Electric has actually already been accomplished um, and the balance that's really left to be done is the part by Associated Electric to uh, take care of that. That's 800 and some dollars. But the total for tonight to be considered technically is $3,530. So you're looking for approval after the fact? <laughs> It, they kind of ran out and did it. At, we talked to them about it, and it just kind of happened. Okay. So, so there. Troy. Do I have to make a positive pro adoption? <laughs> <laughs> Adopt a resolution of the city of Andover, Kansas, approving ad valorem property tax. Wait, that's the wrong one. Yes. <laughs> I just mess with everybody. I guess. <laughs> Approve the Butler Rural Electric Co-op and Associated Electric ex Expenses for re Relocation of Electrical Service. For the emergency siren located at the southeast corner of Andover Road and Southwest 120th Street, the amount of three thousand five hundred thirty dollars. Second. I'm sorry. Who was that? Oh. Brian. Brian. Okay. I'm not used to everybody's voices yet. So <laughs> right. Me Brian. neither. Troy and Brian. Okay. So, Troy made a motion. Brian seconded it to uh, approve the. Uh, mm -hmm expenses uh, with uh, Butler Rural Electric Co-op and Associated Electric. How much was that month, Donald Mayor? 3530 It was uh, 3000 $3,530. Okay. Further discussion? Is there anyone here from Flint Hills that does not want to see this go in? <laughs> <laughs> Well, and I was just thinking that hopefully my voice is distinctive enough that you'll recognize when I speak. Oh, my Lord. Oh, we lost it. I'm tired. <laughs> Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> Motion carries. Mr. Detter, what is your limit authority here? Anyways. Well, this was a fair. Uh, yeah, but what I'm saying is you could have approved this, right? What, what, what do we have your well, limit set up? You guys may not have policy want a siren. Like Mr. Warrington said, uh, I, the people in Flint Hills National, I would assume. You didn't answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Item 13, uh, fourth subdivision, final plat and developer's agreement for Hodges Fourth. Sorry, uh, the developer here is uh, here. If he could s speak just a little bit about the project, you know, it's just a plat. We don't have to go through the checklist or anything. But thanks for staying. He's been here all night. So, <laughs> Tom Ballman from uh, Wichita, Kansas, 1246 North Forest View Court. Um, partner Craig Hill lives here in Andover on Crestline 728. I think is the address. Yeah. Um, anyhow. I don't know how we always get behind a teardown problem, but <laughs> I feel like we got a lot of work done tonight because I was able to work on some projects myself. Um, this here was two lots, and we've combined <clears throat> them to one lot. Uh, there was two old abandoned houses on there, and we have um, tore them down. And the idea is to personally finance a street into there at the specs of the city for what they want for a street to carry a fire truck or a trash truck to some extent and build 16 doorways in a um, triplex and duplex configuration on the property where's this where's the bigger location of this mm -hmm. 
Uh, it's generally located off of Main Street in the older part of the community. The older north part of or south? Uh, yeah. It'd be North Main. Like what block? 1100. Okay. 1100 North Main. Okay. 1100 North Main. Are we ready? Yes. Mr. Mayor, I would uh, move to accept the final plat of Hodges 4th Subdivision and approve the developer's agreement. Second. Motion by CR and second by Greg to uh, approve this subdivision final plat and accept the developer's agreement as presented. Further discussion. Can I see this on a map, please? It's right here. Can I see it on a bigger map? I mean a smaller map. <laughs> So here's Mike Street next to our capital, Taekwondo, and it's right. You might remember we redid that street of, oh, maybe five, six years ago. We right. Okay. What's directly to the west of this parcel? Um, there is a subdivision or a, a, a an apartment complex that was done by uh, Sharp, if you might recall that. That's just a That's little directly to west of And Teradyne Country Club's over there a little bit, too. Okay, so this is pretty adjacent to Teradyne Country Club. Yes. That's the point I was trying to make. <laughs> Further discussion. Hey, wait a second. Further discussion. <laughs> All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank Item you. 14, you're welcome. Thanks for staying. Uh, we have a, here, go ahead, Jenny. It's conference hosting agreement. Um, we spoke about this briefly at workshop last night before you tonight, a hosting agreement with National Fireworks Association. As you know, we're hosting their shoot site for their annual convention, September 9th through the 14th. This just outlines what our responsibilities are to them, what their responsibilities back to us are. Legal has reviewed it and you have a signed copy in front of you. Any questions? I'd be happy to answer. Mr. Mayor. Carolyn. I move to approve the agreement and authorize the mayor to sign for the National Fireworks Association Conference. Second. Motion by Caroline, second by Troy to uh, approve the agreement and authorize the mayor to sign as presented. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Item 15, Utility Department Equipment Purchase. This item is not on the consent agenda because it's an unbudgeted item. It's been discussed during the budget times, um, but we, it's one of those things we kept moving. It got moved to the 19 CIP. But unfortunately, as mentioned in the, my memo, the current inserter machine that we have will no longer be serviced by a contract and it's about seven years old and it is starting to need more repairs and if it's not covered by a service contract it doesn't look good um so i talked with the two companies that have local representatives for servicing machines which is midwest single source and pitney bows and they're both on the state contract got a couple of different um, quotes from them and in talking with the Julie Spires, who actually does the inserting of the sewer bills, the folding and the inserting machine. Um, what would work best for us? We are recommending the purchase of the um, DS75I with the addition of a maxi feeder, which allows pretty much an entire box of envelopes to be put on it to be fed through instead of about an inch worth of envelopes to go through at a time um, at the purchase price of $13,896 and beginning in the second year, annual maintenance of $1,294. The cost of this would be shared by 60% by the wastewater department, 20% by stormwater, and 20% by trash and recycling. The general fund would not be picking up any of this. Questions? Motions? Mr. Mayor, I move to approve the purchase of the DS-75I folder inserter with additional maxi feeder from Midwest single source in the amount of $13,896. I'll second. second. Uh, motion by Greg, second by Mike to approve the purchase as requested. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item 16. We need somebody to recess the city council meeting and, con and convene the public building commission. Excuse me. So move. Second. 
Motion by CR, second by Troy to recess the city council meeting. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Mr. President. I uh, call the public building commission meeting for Tuesday, January 30, 2018. Roll call starting at my far <clears throat> right will be your name, Commissioner. Uh, Mike Warrington, Commissioner. Greg Schneider, Commissioner. Clark C.R. Nelson, President. Ben Lawrence, Commissioner. Troy Tabor, Commissioner. Caroline Hale, Commissioner. Brian Schwann, Commissioner. Very good. Uh, item three is minutes. Uh, do I have a motion on the minutes for the January 9, 2018 commission minutes? Mr. President, I move to approve minutes as presented. Motion, second. Second. Got a motion by Greg, second by Caroline to approve the minutes as presented. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item number four, the Capitol Federal Amphitheater Circle R. <laughs> the house sound system. Anybody want to tell us what a great deal this is? So um, what we're bringing before you tonight is a, when the amphitheater was built or it led, it was elected not to include a house sound in it um, by us. I guess my advice. I, I guess the logic is by us buying it direct, it would be cheaper than having key just buy and add cost to it. I guess I, I really wasn't a part of that. I don't know what the actual reasoning for that was, but now we're bringing it to you because we, we need it for our, all the events that aren't a large concert that are going to have anything out there. School events, um, we'll President, use it during GAD. He's exactly right. On our major concert events, we rent the equipment, all the sound equipment and everything, but I advised them we're going to have a lot more than just major concerts out there, and there needs to be a sound system that can project into the audience. Maybe not, um, it's not nowhere near the scope of projecting out to 10,000 people, but there's going to be events, maybe even church services, school performances, stuff like that, that they need the microphone and an amplifying system, and that's what this is. Is that a motion? That is a motion to approve. Do we have a second? Second. We got a motion by uh, Uncle Ben and a second by Brian. Uh, to authorize the commission president to sign a proposal for WAV services in amount of $20,754. Further discussion? Yeah, when you're talking about that projection, you remember when we were looking at ticket prices, so would you say that would take it back into the A, B, like those first, that maybe the, that lower third, not, not into the big crowd area, of course. So when we're talking about what this will project to, it's a different level when you're talking about like a concert sound versus a theatrical sound. So I would say to go up adequately up all the way up the grass slope area to the ring of the top ring or so. That would be good. I mean, that's so. what I'm thinking the smaller venues might be. So, okay. I just and wanted to ask that question. How far did we expect it to? You, you would probably be able to actually hear it over in our parking lot if you really wanted to, but adequately it'd be a lot closer yes would this be mounted across the top trusses as well so on the top truss where the capital federal um logo logo or whatever's going on up there on that beam and the larger columns coming up i think we're going to put it right up there in a corner and it'll be painted black the speakers will be painted black so it'll be won't stick out it'll match the color of the they wouldn't interfere with the way that in real and regular concerts like we wouldn't be in their way no because and we made sure that when we we're looking at where the pick points were that the the array speakers would be brought up would be it'd be out of their way okay further cool. discussion all those in favor of the motion say aye aye, aye. those same sign <clears throat> motion carries item five Central Park Lodge, the Lodge patio sound system. So while we were looking at the house, or the house sound system and everything, it came up that maybe we want to look at a patio sound system for when you have a wedding party or something out there. And um, this system that we're proposing tonight 
we thought about it before the patio was poured and we laid conduit out to the poles so that we could actually mount speakers on the poles. So all the conduit is in place and everything like that. So we can just retroactively go and put the speakers up there. There would be a amplifier system that would go into the, into the storage area that we have now where we keep the tables and chairs. There is a uh, ability for you to have two wireless mics out there on the patio. Um, there is a, uh, ultimate ways to connect it to, you know, if you wanted to play some other sound device through there, you could do that. Um, this price is $8,435, and uh, this is what we're bringing for your consideration tonight. This will also would come out of the uh, GAD Festivals Fund, not out of general fund directly. Will this be part of a uh, rental when someone rents it, they have the option? Yes. How quickly do you, we think we'll recoup these funds? From rentals? Yes. Well, I place booked all the time. I do think this summer is going to be a little rough on the wedding industry because we have the whole summer Concerts. booked until we have our concert dates completely mm. firm because we've obviously, some of you remember, mm -hmm. have ran into that in the past mm -hmm. where we had a wedding booked, we rescheduled the concert, and we had to deal with that conflict. So we were proactive, we reserved the whole lodge, and now people who are planning weddings are probably past the point of looking for their summer venues. So for this year, I'm not feeling super great about your wedding rentals, but next year our goal is to book 19's acts the summer of 18, so that we are able to release the facility very early, um, probably before 2019. And then I think it will rent very quickly like hotcakes. How's that for scientific data? <laughs> Any further comments? Entertain a motion. So moved to approve. Second. We got a uh, motion by Ben and a second by Greg to approve the uh, uh, Lodge patio sound system in the amount of $8,435. Uh, further discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Same sign. If you're opposed, motion carries. I would now entertain a motion to adjourn and a reconvening of the city council meeting. So moved. Second. Second. Motion and who did the motion? Troy. 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 Brian. <laughs> Brian did the second. Troy and, Two seconds. Oh. I think the first one came down there. And Brian's song was down there on the, on the end. <laughs> From now on, you got to write all names down that made each. I never write your names. Okay. All, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. All right. Thanks. We are down to member items. Do you know you can vote? Right? Brian, you want to start us off? You can vote. Yeah, yeah. make a motion on Tuesday. As the president. Okay. So what's that? Member items. Member items. Thank you. I'd like to thank the council for throwing me the wolves my first uh, <laughs> 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 on such a big vote, but uh, that's all I really have. You, you learn more that way. Caroline. I have no um, item for this evening. Troy. Um, no items this evening either. CR. No items. Great. No items. None today. Right. Staff have anything? Speak up. This is the remember the the that happened the RSVP for the chamber. Chamber remember by the fifth of February. I wanted to share with you guys that I have been working with Jeff Hall for the last couple of years. Not necessarily the same packet because some items are always private, of course, Privileged. before they've been approved, such as uh, any um, uh, hiring and things like that. We'll be you don't to include non-elected personnel in there, right? The, the non-elected personnel items in your packet tonight or would not have been public. They will be in the minutes. But um, just wanted you to know, so if you have any questions, but what really what it means is that what we talked about a little over a year ago, uh, you can see the same information we see. Pardon? The public will be able to see the same information we see. That's yes. what I was going to yes. comment on, that somebody made it a comment. Megan Tice was the first person 
uh, something about that I was knew what kind of recommendation had been made to us or something. I think something uh, to that effect. Oh well, that's <clears> the memos. Uh -huh. yeah. That the staff is typing up that goes along with all of their information. By the way, who's making the determination of what goes in there, what's appropriate to go in there, and what's a, not appropriate to go in there? Do you do that? Not I, I approve. You do that. I approve every agenda item. I look at well, it. Well, you are you approving the material that goes on the I, backside? I look at it. Yeah. And okay. I'm just make sure because there, there's obviously we we want to be able to blame somebody when <laughs> yeah, you release something that you shouldn't have, and vice versa. To be quite honest with you, for some of the staff that has been here this all this time. Um, I have been their software, and I'm no longer the software, and I do not look at these items like I did when we were doing it, right. like we did over a year ago. I know that. And yeah. so now I don't see a lot of these items. You just and they do attaching them, process. copying them, and yeah. it is for the new for our newbies. <clears throat> no problem. Mark, he loves it. The new people they are no problem with it. Some of the people, it's just a change, and it and it is not a great big change, but it is a change. For because they can just insert this into your agenda, right? Mm -hmm. yes. They can insert their packet of info. <laughs> right. But you're looking at the entire agenda, including all the information related to each agenda item. Is that what you're telling me? I attempt to review it as much as possible. Okay. And at the end of the day, yes, it's on me. Now, I'm not saying staff's not going to hear about it if they screw <laughs> something up and I hear about if it. If they put <laughs> something in, well, yeah. you got to put it all in there. Right. But then you got to weed out the stuff. Right. It shouldn't be I, I expect them to give me accurate information and accurate documents, and but ultimately it's up to me to make sure it gets okay. it correctly. <laughs> Staff, have anything else? Let's go. Move to adjourn. Second. Motion by CR, second by Greg. Further discussion? In favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? We are adjourned. Do I need